as tradition now has shaped it, I will, before turning to the opening remarks, the word of welcome by our distinguished Ukrainian envoy to the United States, touch very shortly on two matters. I'm proud to call them why and how of the gathering, simply the context of the discussion and the rules of the discussion. Okay, quickly about the why, especially that for those who will be joining us for the first time. This time, no waxing poetic about a forearm series of its 24th edition, just a quick review of the endeavor and its intentions. On the cusp of the millennium, i.e. in 1999, 2000, the core sponsoring organizations of this event called them the American Friends of Ukraine. It is a crucial geopolitical um, 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 paradigm shift. For one, Ukraine, while still recovering from the Soviet past, signaled that both fruits, um, both fruits, executive branch and its legislation. Its intention to head west was more precisely to ultimately become a paid member of the Euro Atlantic community that have a stronger ties to the United States and similarly to its North American neighbor, Canada, as well as eventual membership in the EU for NATO as the final outcome. Especially critical to that equation was the policy makers and shapers of the United States in bipartisan fashion responded to the initiative in a very positive way, quickly embracing the notion of a burgeoning of the strategic partnership between the two nations. Delighted by the development, the self-same American friends in Ukraine decided to put together a forum to study the phenomenon more closely. They aptly called it Ukraine's quest for mature nation state of a round table. The gathering proved to be one for the ages. Two days of intensive uh, discussion established that the perceived paradigm shift was desired by all parties. Armed with that success, the organizers decided to repeat the event and use the said gatherings to monitor the progress of Ukraine's Western vector, to explore what standards had to be met and what paths had to be chosen in order to achieve the required Euro Atlantic end result. Counting the first, the initial 12 forms were brought as trilogies. The first three examined the specific changes in Ukrainian foreign policy that might result from the embrace of a Western vector. The second three looked at the internal dynamics that pre-force had to occur, movements for ever more developed maturity of the market economy, more stable democratic quality, and, and ever more established a tolerant national identity. The third set explored for Ukraine effective uh, you know, links to EU, NATO, and Western oriented structures like the Peace Guide Group, the Weimar Triangle, and Guam. I really, sir, Chief Ambassador, I really miss all those structures that we used to have. Uh, the third, uh, the fourth trilogy looks for ways to strengthen Ukraine's bilateral ties to leading countries in the Euro Atlantic community, as well as how to handle its relationship with Russia while it was doing so. These issues touched upon the the issues touched upon in the named forms were essentially always overarching in nature, above the fray of the ever boisterous and constantly situational political scene in Ukraine. But starting in 11, the, the described form did a serious hiccup. At one point, the very Vaison Etra of the Quest Roundtable seemed threatened. As the Yanukovych presidency of the regime began to reveal its darker side, both in foreign policy and domestic, the situational increasingly impinged upon the overarching attack. The overarching Ukraine's chosen path the West never did not seem so overarching. During that period, the quest, rather than surrendering the name, um, the name fear, or surrendering to the name fear, took a different tack. For three years, they organized a trilogy, incidentally, in which they began to run a series about whether or how badly or how quickly regression into the dark past is occurring. And they measured it through six criteria, economic well-being, general security, economic uh, energy security, social region, and national identity. Luckily enough for all of us, in 2014, when it's Euro-Atlantic revolution and the ouster of Yanukovych, Ukraine quickly relying its stars to face West again, this time much more decisively, just note the name, Euro Maidan. At the same time, the Kremlin decided to push Ukraine, um, to punish Ukraine for its choice by annexing Crimea and creating a previously undetectable zone, um, conflict zone in Donbass, and so on, winding up, recognizing that the war as a nasty exterior factor 
might still do damage to the Ukraine's dream of your Atlantic. The Ukraine's quest roundtable organizers decided, decided to split the difference. Two sets of gatherings, which ones that you've been to in June would be the report card, the annual report card that would actually measure the day-to-day -day processes in Ukraine, Ukraine receptive, regression or progression. Meanwhile, the roundtable would go back to exploring the overarching issues, looking for ways to effectuate the long des uh, desired uh, move to the Euro-Atlantic future. Returning to the old tri trilogy framework, uh, 2015 to for abiding social cohesion. How uh, Ukraine could better overcome religious, ethnic, and class gender differences. 18 to 20, the series tasked itself with measuring Ukraine's capacity to uh, adopt a Western way to defend itself, its ability to embrace the methods of historically successful NATO alliance and its attitudes towards professionalism, clear strategic vision, and inoperability with allies, which I think is actually showing up on the battlefield today. Starting in 21 and concluding in this year, the Quest Roundtable series turned to exploring and evaluating Ukraine's effort to establish a distinctive yet broad-minded national identity, past, present, and future. Our conference, the last in the series, and the one dedicated to contemplating the issue going forward, will attempt to ponder Ukraine's optimal face to the world in the coming decades. With a nation possessed of a well-developed self-image, playing a worthy leadership role in the Black Sea region, occupying a valuable place in the Euro-Atlantic community and being a respected presence in the global affairs. And that's what we will be discussing. And I'm glad that our, our audience has, has finally arrived. Um, the, the fact is that we're going to be discussing with some of the most important people making those decisions, starting with, with Ambassador Markarova, who by now um, is, is, is legend, and ending with uh, Majority Leader um, uh, Chuck Schumer uh, at, at the end of the process, with a lot of very, very serious players in Washington in between. So um, with that, all I can say is rules of the game we will talk about after I introduce our next speaker. Um, I, again, uh, Ambassador Markova, in the last two years, and I've watched you in the last year, uh, you have become the face of fighting Ukraine. And so I'm just very honored that you made the time, because I know how busy you are, uh, that you made the time to make it and, and speak to us. Thank you, ma'am. It's, it's, the floor is all yours at this point. Thank you very much, Yarko Panasarinsky. It's really a pleasure to be back to the round table. Now, the 20th point to talk about something that is very important. I'm delighted to see not only so many good people, great people, actually, uh, friends of Ukraine, friends of democracy and freedom in the audience, and all those who join online with us. We are at the pivotal moment today in, in the history, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole planet. And, you know, unfortunately for us, the battlefield between the good and evil, between democracy and autocracy, when right through Ukraine, and Ukraine is not only fighting, but also bearing the most difficult and the highest point of this battle. For 800 and 588 days, Ukraine is fighting in the full-fledged phase of this war, which, as we all know, did not start 588 days ago. It didn't even start in 2014 when Russia invaded us for the first time. It started much earlier, and generations of Ukrainians fought in this war. We always talk about the last period renewed for Ukrainian independence since 1991, when the majority of Ukrainians, more than 90% of Ukrainians, which is again a remarkable number for any democracy, voted decisively to be independent. Uh, we can also talk about, and Panzeritsky touched upon it already, about the three revolutions that we had in Ukraine. First one, the revolution on granite, which actually was the revolution for independence itself. The second, the Orange Revolution, which was the revolution for democracy. 
The people went to the streets, not because they favored one candidate over the other. The people went to the streets because somebody tried to steal their choice. Somebody tried to rig the election. Somebody tried to deny people the right for which Ukrainians are willing to die, to be able to choose our own government independently, to be able to change our people, our, our uh, presidents and members of the parliament on a regular basis, like any democracies do. And of course, the, the third uh, Euromaidan, the third revolution, the revolution of dignity, was the revolution for our rights not only to be independent, which was a part of it from the first revolution, not only our right to be democratic, but also our right to be who we are, to be Ukrainian, to be European, to join or rejoin, I would, I should say, Europe and the transatlantic community where we always belong. Because again, since the voting in 1991, Ukrainians reconfirmed the, the choice to be free and democratic over and over again. And every time we did it, the response from Russia was to attack us. So now, the past 18 months, we have seen a lot of changes. Unlike in 2014, we had something to fight with because the eight years of reforms, nine years of reforms almost before that, have created Ukrainian institutions for the first time in Ukraine, have created sufficient resources, at least not to be on our own right from the beginning like it was in 2014, when the country was robbed blind by the regime before that, when we didn't have the armed forces literally because the Russian Minister of Defense and Russian head of the Secret Service and Russian infiltrated uh, people made sure that before Russia attacked us in 2013, they have destroyed so much in Ukraine, what even was not built since 1991. So the situation was different than all Ukrainians, as we said publicly, as I as an ambassador was telling everyone here before February 24th, that Ukrainians will fight back, we will not surrender, we will not give up, and we will fight for our country. And yes, unfortunately, it came as a surprise, even to some of our friends and allies. But I think now we don't have to prove that anymore. Everyone knows that Ukrainians not only value and love our freedom and democracy, but we're willing to fight for it. The second part that has changed is actually our friends and allies. Again, unlike in 2014, when yes, the position was very clear, nobody accepted the annexation of Crimea. But the situation now was different in a sense that our friends and allies, and I'm so grateful to our strategic friend number one, the US, and again, very important on a very strong bipartisan basis, that they stood with us from the day one in providing weapons, in providing support to Ukraine. And I just want to know that how unprecedented it is in the history of our relations with the US that we have received grant support we don't need to return it. So not only the US is helping us through the four, four supplementary budget that Congress was able to adopt and the administration is able to find and locate and buy and transport uh, everything to Ukraine. Again, not everything that we need. That's what well, well, I'm talking about that at the end of my speech. But you know, it has been a, a huge support, a large operation a very bipartisan operation. And with the clear understanding that we together have to win this one. Also on sanctions, because it's as important as to support Ukraine with weapons and financial resources and, and all other support that, that our partners can provide to us. But also it's important to continue strengthening the sanctions, sanction and isolate the Russia. So that working together on supporting Ukraine and uh, you know, uh, punishing Russia and denying them the, the revenues and possibility to continue this war. Working together, these two streams will help us to get to victory faster. And, you know, with all this right now, again, I said that in, in a pivotal moment, we need the continued support. We need what our armed forces and, and the Ministry of Defense and general military people are saying, we need to stay the course. 
the victory is in sight. Anyone who would tell you that it's again a very long, unwinnable war are wrong. No, this war is a very winnable war. Our brave soldiers on the front line are showing it every day. The previous campaigns that we have conducted liberated Kyiv, which Russians were spreading faith that it will fall in three days, liberated Kyiv Oblast, liberated Kharkiv Oblast, liberated Kherson. All of that with different time frames, with different hardships and resources that were needed, but none of the campaigns was lost by the Ukrainian armed forces. And the summer campaign we're having now, very difficult, probably one of the most difficult since the World War II, judging by the lens of the front line, by the, all the defense that Russians have prepared there. But we are moving very deliberately forward and every day brings us more Ukrainian land or Ukrainian villages back under Ukrainian control. And we have to be very clear. While for Russians, it, it's, we don't even know what is it about. It's about the neo imperialistic, chauvinistic, uh, terroristic, whatever you call it, uh, fake ideas in the head of their leader, but also unfortunately in so many Russians, because it's not just Putin's war, it's Russian Federation war against us. For us, it's very clear what is, is it about. It's about our loved ones. It's about our people. It's about those who have been killed and tortured on the uncontrolled territory. So we are moving forward because the faster we move, the more people we will be able to save. It's about our democracy. It's about our independence. And frankly, it's about, you know, whether the UN Charter and all the nice slogans that we all say and we all want to live by, by territorial integrity, by sovereignty, by the right of the people to live like they choose to live in their own countries, about the sacredness of the borders, which are internationally recognized borders. And our borders have been recognized by everyone, including Russia, in 1991. So this round, we have to win together all the coalition of countries, whether we're talking about 54 or more countries that join the so-called Ramstein group, the Ukraine contact group that helps us on the battlefront, or it's about 154 countries that voted to condemn this horrible invasion at the UN, or any other form or the future peace formula forum, which President Zelensky has initiated as early as in 2022, because nobody wants peace more than Ukrainians, and it's a very holistic formula, which will provide not only the conditions for the just and lasting peace to return to Ukraine, but also to prevent other aggressors. Who are looking now at Russia, and they will make their decisions whether to invade other innocent country, not based on what we all say publicly, but on what we all, a civilized world, will be able to do to help Ukraine to win and Russia to lose. And this is the goal, and I'm so glad that you have uh, excellent panelists in so many panels, and you will discuss different issues of that, because it's about policy, and it's about politics, and it's about culture, and it's about education, and it's about weapons, and it's about business cooperation. And all of that, all these relations should come together and work as one mechanism in order for us to get where we need to be, to win, to win in this battle. Slava Ukraini, and God bless America. And God bless America. <laughs> Comment because Pandarevsky said a lot of Americans said the hero of Slava. <laughs> and you know, when I arrived as an ambassador, I had this formula when we created the Ukraine house and opened its doors that it's for all Ukrainians, whether by birth, by blood, or by choice. <laughs> and the by choice part is a very growing point. But that's why we have a broad minded national identity for all Ukrainians. Ma'am, <laughs> um, would you accept a, a question? What do you want? I would love to go back. Yes. Okay. Then uh, uh, have a great discussion. I, I was just going to say, uh, Madam Ambassador, I, I mean, you truly are the face of the of, of, of internet's problem here in the United States. And I just wish you all the luck. And I know that this path is going to be difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador.
Okay. Uh, now, after the, um, yeah, I would actually say that I know the ambassador has to take a picture of the money. Okay, are we ready? Are the people on the screen? As well? As, uh, okay. We now move on to our first plenary session that is molding an engaging and inspiring national historical narrative. I will be asking Ambassador Roman Papaduk, the first ambassador um, to Ukraine from the United States in the 91-92 period uh, to come as moderator. And then the panelists, I know that we have President uh, uh, Stephen Nix, um, regional director. I'm going to be asking Stephen to uh, come up. I think he exited with the ambassador for a second. And then I think on, on screen, we should have three. We should have uh, Dr. Sehi Kvit, and he's here. Uh, we have Adrian Kuritnitsky, and he should be here, yes. And we have Dave Kramer from the Bush Institute, and he's here as well. Okay, so with that, um, Ambassador Papadouk, yeah, Steve is here some. Yeah. Yeah, we need, yeah. We need the kids to stop having the pictures with the ambassador. <laughs> and, and Steve Nix joined them. There Steve, is. there he is. Thank you. Sir. Would we be able to have all three on the screen by any chance? All right, thanks, guys. So put all five on. Yeah, thank you. No, no, I'm saying uh, I'm saying when it comes to uh, <laughs> yes, choir. Thank you, guys. We're good. Okay. All right. Did everybody get their picture with the ambassador? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> um, ambassador Kopiduk, I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here once again. And uh, Walter, I'm congratulated once again for putting this conference together. I'm sure we'll be as successful now. This conference is that you held. I think mean, they're very instrumental in terms of bringing forth to the American public and the greater general international community the importance of Ukraine, the issues Ukraine faces, as well as the challenges the United States has in terms of helping Ukraine. Um, this morning, we start off the conference with a discussion of the history or the historical narrative of Ukraine and ethnic identity, I guess one can say. As we all know, uh, the history, ethnic identity, cultural identity is very important. And uh, is it a very important part of the platform of any nation in terms of building its identity, its cohesiveness, and its statehood? Uh, throughout the centuries, we are all very familiar with the repression that the Ukrainian nation suffered at the hands of various empires, most notably by the Tsarist and Russian empires, Soviet empires, all are very familiar to us. Um, we know that throughout the Russian occupations of Ukraine, the Ukrainian language was barred, the culture was, uh, uh, the language was barred at times, as I mentioned. The uh, people were rounded up, the intelligentsia was rounded up, uh, and Russification took place, as well as in other parts of the Russian Empire. Uh, most notably, during the course of this war that started in 2022, we see that a uh, aim of the Russian invasion is to obliterate the identity of the Ukrainian nation. Uh, we see this in various ways, the way bombings take place to civilians, the uprooting of children and taking them into Russia, Russia and Russian-occupied areas. We see this by the targeting of cultural sites of Ukraine, such as churches, museums, schools, libraries, etc. 
Uh, most glaringly, we're all very familiar with uh, Putin's July 21 uh, article, which he claimed that there's never been such a thing as a Ukrainian people nor a Ukrainian state. So this kind of gives you an idea of the struggle that Ukraine faces. As we've seen throughout the centuries, Ukraine has always been able to sustain itself and maintain its identity. Well, and I'm certain that Ukraine will overcome this recent challenge from the Russian side and come out ahead on this, uh, in this war and will sustain its nationhood, its own identity and its culture. Uh, helping us this morning to kind of look into this particular issue are four experts, as I would say. Uh, let me just briefly introduce them. Their full uh, bios are in the board, they are in the meeting packet, so I'm sure you're very familiar with them. But joining us this morning uh, from Kiev is Sergei Kvit, who is president of the Cape Mahill Academy. Also joining us uh, is Adrian Karanitsky, a senior fellow at the Atlanta Council, and David Kramer, the managing director for global policy at the President George W. Bush Institute. The three of them will be joining us via video or Zoom. And joining us here today is uh, Stephen Nix, uh, Eurasia Regional Director for the International Republican Institute. I'm delighted that they could be with us. I look forward to their presentations and then to the Q&A that will follow. I think what we will do is just start off uh, kind of in uh, the order I read them the names out. Uh, we'll start with Serhi Crete over in Kiev. And Serhi, it's good to see you again. I'm delighted you're able to join us. And I look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. First, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. And I'm really glad to have the opportunity to participate in our roundtable. And I believe that all our topics are really, uh, really important. Uh, so, uh, the first, uh, the first question uh, to be answered is what could actually be an inspiring national historical narrative in the Ukrainian dimension if, according to the dominant uh, Russian stereotype picked up by many Western historians and intellectuals, only criminals and anti-Semites uh, could fight for Ukrainian independence uh, from early modern times uh, to the first uh, 21st century. So it is, uh, is it possible to create an attractive uh, national narrative in Ukraine, which would be different from the uh, perception of uh, Ukrainians from the outside within other uh, national narratives and, and contexts? Um, this question uh, does not have an uh, unequivocal answer. We can mention that even American and Canadian historians still have a tendency to interpret uh, the military conflicts uh, that uh, took place in the history of both countries differently. Um, if we remember the efforts of, of Polish and German historians uh, to create a joint historical history uh, textbook, uh, the most controversial interpretation was not even the Second World War, but the time of uh, the Crusaders. Uh, the point is uh, that uh, the national historical narrative uh, should be shaped primarily by the efforts of Ukrainian society itself. We should take into account both the approaches of uh, professional historians uh, and the, the wider social context of uh, a more ma uh, mass perception and understanding of old history, particularly in the conditions when uh, the Ukrainians were deprived of that history either during the times of uh, Soviet Russian totalitarianism, or even earlier during the times of uh, the same Russian Empire. In addition, uh, since for centuries, the territory of Ukraine was divided between neighboring countries, uh, which themselves claimed imperial greatness, if it necessary to overcome a similar uh, deviations and uh, self-limitations with joint efforts. This task is complex and long-term. Uh, the issue of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's borders is solved uh, more easily, relying on uh, current international law. Summing up, uh, the formation of an attractive national historical narrative is a task of uh, Ukrainians as them themselves, connected with uh, historical research on the one hand and uh, the political culture of Ukrainian society on the other. Currently, both factors cause optimism. Uh, these tasks can be performed uh, only in uh, 
an independent Ukrainian state. Uh, historical experience shows that the loss of independence always leads to the formation of only negative historical narratives about, about the nation, which thus loses the opportunity to tell about itself. It means, uh, I think, uh, my point is that only Ukrainians uh, can perform uh, uh, themselves, uh, including uh, uh, his, uh, the issue of, of uh, historical narratives. Uh, it means only, uh, you know, all these issues only depend on the uh, result of current Russian, uh, Russian Ukrainian war. Uh, if we lose, uh, we will uh, uh, represent as uh, criminals and uh, it was in the past and it will be in the future. That is why uh, this question not only, uh, not only uh, you know, connected with, with uh, professional historical research and uh, you know, very deep professional discussions, it, it's, it's very political question and we, we should understand this. Um, I, uh, once I participated in, the, uh, in, uh, in uh, such discussion at Stanford University and uh, uh, you know that uh, 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 it, it was it was uh, the um, a speech of one uh, Belgian histo historian who focused uh, on the uh, um, Putin's uh, narratives about Crimea, and uh, he represented uh, uh, those narratives uh, that it was absolutely ridiculous. But uh, Russia. Uh, still has a lot of uh, a lot of money for that and a lot of tools for that, uh, you know. And that is why previously Ukraine didn't uh, didn't have uh, the opportunity and uh, resources, particular resources for uh, self representation uh, by uh, historical uh, narratives. That is why uh, uh, once more it's a very political question and question. Question directly depend uh, dependent to the result of the war. Of course, so we we, uh, we believe uh, in our victory and uh, and the Slavo training. Well, those comments, uh, particularly the emphasis of uh, independence, being obviously a key element in any historical narrative that can be developed. Uh, with that, I'd like to call upon Adrian Kadaminski. Adrian, are you ready? Uh, absolutely. Hi. Uh, a great pleasure to be with you and a great pleasure to be engaged in this discussion and in this dimension of Ukraine's uh, identity and, and the forming of its identity. I think it's important to start by noting that um, uh, Ukraine is, uh, the Ukrainian people are consolidated and united as never before. Uh, the polling, which I, I know uh, is uh, Steve Nix's territory, and I won't go into it in any uh, great detail, but the polling confirms 97% of deep pride in uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, state, in the Ukrainian nation. Th walking down the streets of Kyiv today versus a decade ago, you hear the predominance, almost the universality of Ukrainian being spoken. Uh, I recall with, you know, even 10 years ago, you would see kids coming out of school where all the language of instruction was in Ukrainian and the majority of them, once they walked out of their classroom doors, started speaking uh, Russian. No more. Today, uh, Kyiv is a, a Ukrainian city, and the statistics, which I think Steve can also uh, bear out, show an, an amazing drift from uh, Russian speaking to uh, Ukraine, predominantly Ukrainian or Ukrainian and Russian, with only 9% of the population saying that it, that it speaks Russian. Uh, so that means over the last, uh, since 2014, 
a number, there have been a number of newcomers to the cause which I think the the true founding fathers of Ukraine uh, intended. Now, the true founding fathers, I would say, were not the old communist elite or the red directors that saw economic opportunity or political opportunity to take control of the assets of a state or of a state and to, to advantage themselves as the Soviet Union was collapsing. I mean the people like Vyacheslav Chernovil, the Harlan brothers, the, the, the Lukyanenko, the the people who were the strong, consistent advocates of a Ukrainian language and Ukrainian uh, and a Ukrainian state identity rooted primarily in the Ukrainian people, but welcoming uh, uh, of all who uh, of all who live on the territory as part of a kind of a merger of ethno-political and civic uh, patriotism, civic nationalism. So all these indicators are today, of course, off the charts. I think they're, you know, they're irreversible because I think that the, the, the drift of the remaining population we used to speak of in the East and the South as being sort of Russia-friendly or Russophone, that drift is permanent. That is the territory in which the greatest damage, the greatest damage to civilians, to infrastructure, and huge damage to courageous fighters who are defending their territories, people from those regions. That has created a fundamental transformation. And that also, but it raises the question of how do we how does the state, how, how do we, how does the Ukrainian state speak about itself? How does it look at its present, its past, and, and its more distant past? And here, you know, I think that uh, Ukraine has been uh, caught up in a series, well, let me go back to my, the, the time of the party of regions and the party of uh, of Yanukovych, when um, which had custody over Ukraine, I recall a discussion I had for my sins with Boris Kolesnikov, who was a deputy prime minister, and I sort of said, "Look, <laughs> Ukraine is vulnerable to Russian uh, influence, and you want to maintain." I was speaking to him purely from a party of regions uh, perspective. Ukraine needs to protect itself from Russian influence. You need to be sovereigns in your own country. Why, why don't you build on the traditions of, you know, the Cossack, uh, uh, the Cossack past, uh, some of the democratic elements of uh, the Cossack leadership, uh, even uh, uh, go to the Luhansk rebel, uh, uh, Kondrat Bulavin, who uh, 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 was a kind of a Mazeppa of the East and 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 uh, create a national a national narrative that incorporates some of this and he said oh you know we we have prokofiev we have uh, uh you know uh, sikorsky we have so basically he was he was giving me the Cossacks, it's too controversial, they were anti-Russian, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think Ukraine lived through a period where half of the population was still in the sphere of, of colonialism. And so Ukrainian education has moved away from this, but a conscious discussion of how to not just move the sentiments of people, but to give everybody who has made this drift away from you know, Russophilia or a, a weak sense of national identity. This is important, not just for Ukraine, as it projects its influence to the rest of the world. It's important that this generation and these generations that have made that shift uh, into a unified uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, you know, sentiment, pro-Ukrainian sentiment, patriotic sentiment, that they have a, a sense of their past and that that and the usable past is uh, should be the a selective past. Uh, I'll say something that I think is, you know, may be regarded as as controversial, but I do think that it is important to acknowledge that uh, some currents in Ukrainian nationalism uh, had, for short periods of their existence, uh, anti-Semitic sentiments and anti-Semitic tropes. That is not to say that they were collaborators with the Nazis. That is not to say that they were complicit in the Holocaust. It is to simply say that some of these traditions did have 
as in most of Europe where nationalist and right-wing movements uh, had anti anti-Semitic uh, tropes. Just as, and, and I think it's important to discuss these things openly. It's important to criticize that element of the past, but at the same time to project an accurate description of the the fighters for Ukrainian Ukrainian independence, uh, many of whom, as in the case of the OUN Bandera, were within days of the Nazi takeover of of uh, Ukraine, targeted for uh, destruction, uh, arrest, imprisonment, and execution. And over four thousand of them were so killed as they were re regarded uh, as unreliable. So I think, as I say, it's important to look at the, the clearly at the Cossack past to highlight those dimensions that I think are consonant with a modern liberal democratic uh, you know, tradition and ethos to explain how some of those roots uh, are deeply ingrained in Ukraine's desire for freedom. It's important to rescue uh, leaders like Petlura from the canard that they were anti-Semites. Petlura was a philo-Semite. The UNR was the only government to have Yiddish as one of its uh, languages on its uh, currency and as a, as, a, uh, as a state, as an official language. All of these kinds of things must be part of that narrative because they help explain why Ukraine today is as the title of our conference says for for a forbearing a forbearing uh, has a forbearing national identity which it means in a, in a classical sense that it is not uh, you know enraged by but has a intelligent restrained thoughtful and i would say inclusive way of joining together all of its citizens and even at a time where scapegoating and you know wild anti-russian sentiment could be a dominant trope that is not the dominant trope there is a uh, hatred of what russia is doing and what russians are doing to ukraine there is a hatred of putin but there is not a kind of a deeply ingrained hatred of of uh, the other of the of the russian people and certainly not of ethnically Russian Ukrainians who uh, who are part of Ukrainian society and today many of whom are among its uh, strongest uh, strongest supporters. Now let me say something about the current moment because I think we can talk about the future, but we are dealing with a particularly problematic and dangerous moment where the ideas of Ukrainian identity are extremely important in conveying what that means uh, uh, to a possible Russian victory. What would be the consequences of the deepening of Ukrainian solidarity, identity, engagement, and so on? We know that something like 40 to 50% of Ukrainians and Poles say that someone in their family or some close friend is involved in the war effort, is a fighting on the front. We know that approximately 50% of Ukrainians are either volunteering or providing, and maybe that number is higher in some polls, providing uh, financial support uh, to the war effort. All of this is documented through social media. Some of it is even documented in social media that you know were created by, by, by uh, ethnic Russians and people who, who left Russia. I mean, things like Telegram, uh, not to speak of Facebook, they're all Twitter, they're all in the or X, they're all in the public, they're all in the public domain. So a, a, a country that has achieved a solidarity of purpose, imagine what it will take to create the vision that Russia, that Ukrainians are actually Russians, which is the vision that Putin has put forward and which is currently being implemented in the occupied uh, portions uh, of Ukraine. It is the obliteration of vast storehouses of knowledge, thousands of books that have been published since independence, which have the wrong narrative, the removal of children, the forcible kidnapping of children and their removal to Russia, primarily for ideological reorientation. If Putin were to take over the rest of this Ukrainian territory, apart from the fact that it would unleash maybe 10 million or more refugees fleeing, because with the consciousness that they have, 
they could not many people would not take the risk of being under Russian domination and Russian uh, Russian occupation. But those that remained would be subject to imprisonment for their support of the war effort, imprisonment for their ideas, imprisonment for their choice of culture and uh, and identity. And only a totalitarian occupation, only the recreation if Russia is already nearing totalitarianism in Russia proper, but within the newly occupied Russia, the newly occupied you, you know territories that Russia occupies, it's not Russia, of course. Uh, the the machine that would be required of repression uh, of murder, because uh, we know that there were lists of of uh, cultural leaders, political leaders, uh, et cetera, when Russia was planning its blitz invasion, there were lists of people to be arrested, presumably to be incarcerated and or uh, and or eliminated. All of those, all of those things are going to be magnified because of the shifts that have already occurred in Ukrainian identity. And at this perilous moment when the party of Ronald Reagan is becoming more like the party of Robert La Follette, uh, uh, it is extremely important that we convey to this uh, recalcitrant uh, now majority, presumably in the uh, Republican uh, ranks, what the consequences of this, uh, of, of, in effect, withdrawal of isolationism, of denial of support to Ukraine would be the impact of tens of millions of lives, the restoration of a totalitarian state, of course, the geopolitical consequences, all of these kinds of things. So in a sense, the, this very strength of Ukrainian identity, which has allowed Ukraine to become a fearsome and effective you know, national movement, a national war of resistance against uh, Russian, the Russian invasion, at the same time, were that movement to fail, would result in such a catastrophic uh, disaster, uh, you know, akin to the terrors that we have seen. We saw in Cambodia when Pol Pot and his regime took over. When we saw, you know, the the, the in other in other totalitarian uh, other examples of the totalitarian past. So I'll conclude with that. Say it's important to have an open dialogue about the Ukrainian past. Ukraine, Ukraine is not an anti-Semitic nation uh, as Putin or a fascist nation because Ukrainians lived through Nazi occupation. Uh, Ukrainians lost 10 million lives of civilians, including the, the uh, uh, Jewish population, of civilians and military who served in the, in the war. That has inoculated, and, and including those who served in the nationalist underground, who were hunted down by Nazis. There is simply no space, and that is why Ukrainian, but we need to convey that, that message of the historical past with proper nuance and with acknowledgments of some of the mistakes that these movements uh, uh, made, made in the past, uh, while at the same time upholding the truth about who was a collaborator and who was not, not, a, uh, not a collaborator. So all these issues, I think, will be extremely important in the coming, in the coming years, in the coming decade. Ukraine has incredible uh, social capital. And one of the most important parts of Ukrainian history is its current history, which is to say a new generation of heroes. As, uh, as, as one of my friends in Kiev pointed out, uh, President Zelensky uh, uh, is kind of the first state uh, leader in Ukrainian history, or even major nationalist leader, who did not flee the country as uh, there was the threat of threat of collapse. He stood, he stood and fought. So there is now a new history, a current history of new heroes, which can be merged with the usable past to create a narrative uh, for both the Ukrainian people and for the external world that re you know, re, that defines Ukraine as a uh, open, tolerant, self-confident, democratic uh, polity. I'll end with that. Broad, but yet concise uh, synopsis of uh, Ukrainian national identity building. 
Um, I'd like to point out a number of things. First of all, I think the data you presented at the outset of your remarks so it was very pertinent in terms of the percentages of Ukrainians now speaking Ukrainian and identifying with Ukraine. A second thing that's very important, and it obviously flows into national identity, is the historical history of the Cossack traditions of democracy. I think a lot of people don't realize Ukraine has that strong tradition, and it's a platform on which they can build. I'd like to tie your overall comments into one comment on my own, and I think you kind of alluded to all this. Uh, while Ukraine is in the process of building its own national identity and strengthening it under adverse conditions, obviously, right now, we have to realize that Ukraine identifies Ukrainians on the basis of territory, not, not ethnic identity. So anyone living in Ukraine is a Ukrainian. So while Ukraine is building its national identity, built, you know, going back on its history, it is not doing so at the exclusion of all the other ethnic groups that live in Ukraine. Ukraine is a very inclusive society. And I think that's very important for, for all of us here to realize as well as for the outside world when they look upon Ukraine. Uh, with that, I'd like to now turn to David Kramer. David, are you ready? I am, Roman, thank you. Yes, um, thanks very much. It's great to be with such a, a terrific panel and my thanks to Walter for including me and allowing me to participate uh, remotely here in, in Dallas. Um, Actually, I just I wasn't going to start with this, but I, I thought what Adrian said was so important. I just wanted to mention one uh, point, and that is in, in recent surveys, Ukraine is ranked as one of the least anti-Semitic countries in Europe. And that demonstrates the tremendous progress Ukraine has made, how inclusive it has treated all of its citizens, minorities and others. Progress to be made for sure. Uh, with with not just uh, uh, Jews who live there, others, um, but which country in the world does not face that challenge, I would ask. So I, I could completely agree with what Adrian said. I thought that was very important. I, I did want to uh, also just pick up, uh, we, we've talked about how, uh, particularly since last February, the sense of national identity and nationhood uh, has picked up considerably in Ukraine. But I, I would argue, and I'm not disagreeing with the other speakers because they didn't imply otherwise, but this has been true going back to 1991 and certainly even before that. 1991 in particular, if you look at the referendum for independence that was held in December of that year, 92.3% um, of the population voted to become independent. I think it's also important to break this down by a few regions that are notable today. In Crimea, 54.19% uh, of Crimeans voted for independence. In Sevastopol, it was 57%. Donetsk, it was 83.9%. And in Luhansk, it was 838 So for those who uh, argue in Moscow and, and Putin apologists that some of these territories really belong to Russia, well, that hasn't been the sentiment over the past three decades. And uh, none of these people has been asked in a real free and fair conventional sense in a referendum, certainly not the phony uh, uh, referendum that was conducted in Crimea in 2014, what they really want uh, without the pressure of occupying forces, pointing guns at them and telling them how to vote. So th there has, and throughout, by the way, in that referendum in 91, all the other regions in the countries in the country were in the 80s and 90s. So there was vast support for Ukrainian independence. And uh, I think that sentiment has continued with ups and downs as to be expected. Um, but the uh, role Ukraine played with Kravchuk and the Bel Belovezhia Accords uh, to break up the Soviet Union was a key part of establishing Ukraine as, as independent. And then the country has also experienced, which uh, made it stand out from some of the other countries of peaceful transitions, uh, 94. 2004 was more complicated. Um, as, as has been mentioned already, there was an effort, I think the ambassador alluded to this, an effort to steal that election with, a, uh, with Russian support. Putin's visits to stand with Yanukovych running against Yushchenko was gross Russian interference with that election, although the level of interference has gone much higher since then. And then we saw Ukrainians turn out in the streets 
uh, to demand that their vote counts. They, it was an incredibly pro-democracy and pro-Western demonstration of support by Ukrainians starting in, in 2004 with the peaceful orange revolution that then forced a rerun of that election and of course brought uh, Viktor Yushchenko to, to the presidency. Um, there was disappointment obviously with his tenure, with his time in office, and that led to a, another peaceful transfer of power, uh, which was when Viktor Yanukovych did win the 2010 election and uh, we then, but even under Yanukovych, with, with his pro-Russian orientation, Ukraine was on the verge in 2013 of signing agreements with the European Union, recognizing that Ukraine's future lied in the West, not in the East, until Putin applied such pressure on Yanukovych that Yanukovych uh, uh, folded and then rescinded his intention to sign those agreements triggering the Euromaidan revolution of 2013-2014 that again was pro-Western, pro-democracy, another vast demonstration among Ukrainians that they wanted to be rooted and anchored in the West, that they wanted to join your Atlantic institutions. And that I think too made Ukraine stand out and represented uh, its sense of, of national identity and nationhood. The uh, invasion starting in late February 2014 um, of, and then continuing on until the full-scale invasion in 2022 triggered, I think, a, a certainly a, a renewed sense of national identity among Ukrainians. And uh, we see that in, since February of last year, uh, an even heightened level of national identity among Ukrainians and has been mentioned already, surveys showing that they feel that the country that existed in 1991 from the emergence of the break of the Soviet Union is the country they want back. Um, and so uh, Ukrainians do not support any territorial concessions, do not support any compromises to the Russians, despite Russian pressure to do so, and pressure from some in the West uh, who are urging Ukraine to sacrifice not just land, but conceivably millions of people who would be consigned to a, a repressive Russian control and regime. And so we see Ukrainians, I think, uh, defending their, their land, their freedom, fighting for their lives um, against a, an invading and occupying Russian force. And that too heightens the sense of national identity and nationhood that we have, have seen from Ukraine. Um, th there is just a clear sense, I think, among Ukrainians that Ukraine is Europe. It is part of Europe and belongs in Euro-Atlantic institutions, including the EU and NATO. But it's on that last point that I just wanna make uh, a, a, an additional comment, which is you hear in Moscow and you hear in some Western circles that uh, this is all the fault of NATO, as if Ukraine has no agency uh, in pursuing its own future, pursuing its own orientation. And of course, none of this is true. I was in the State Department at the time when the three leaders at the time, Yushchenko, Yatsenyuk, and Timoshenko, requested a membership action plan for Ukraine in 2008. Of course, they didn't get it, though they were told, along with Georgia, that Ukraine would become a member of NATO without saying how or when. Um, in 2013, of course, NATO is not the issue. It was Yanukovych's plan to sign agreements with the European Union. NATO was not being discussed. Why? Because in 2010, after Yanukovych became president, he signed legislation making Ukraine a non-aligned state. So Ukraine was actually not even seeking a deeper relationship or a membership, I should say, with NATO. It, it actually did have a decent relationship with NATO and conducted a number of exercises and training with NATO during Yanukovych's time. But it was after, and this is, will be my last point, it was after the invasion of Ukraine in 2014 that interest among Ukrainians picked up. In 2008, it was very low among Ukrainians. It continued to be low during Yanukovych's time. But not surprisingly, not shockingly, 
a Russian invasion of Ukraine drummed up interest among Ukrainians to join NATO to get that kind of protection that NATO membership affords a country. And of course, the support for joining NATO uh, increased even more after the 2022 uh, full-scale invasion of the country. But uh, let's also remember that even there, Zelensky had been talking about NATO membership uh, since he was elected in 2019, but wasn't getting anywhere. Even President Biden rather stiff-armed him uh, and said corruption is a problem for Ukraine as it was an obstacle for NATO membership. Zelensky, despite his efforts to deepen relationship with the alliance, really wasn't getting anywhere. So the, the NATO enlargement card that uh, Putin and his apologists use is simply that. It is Kremlin propaganda that has no basis in, in reality and no basis in fact. The last thing I just want to say is about Putin. Ukrainians, obviously, first and foremost, deserve the credit for being where they are with this strong sense of nationhood and national identity. Um, but Mr. Putin uh, unintentionally deserves a little credit too. Uh, I, I think Putin over the years has produced a rallying effect among Ukrainians who resent his interference in the country in 20, 2004 and since uh, 2014, uh, the aggression, the invasion, the uh, gross human rights abuses and war crimes and even genocide that Putin and his forces have been responsible for. So uh, it shows how Putin's policies tend to backfire on Russia's national interest, but they pursue Putin's interest because what he doesn't want to see is a successful, thriving, independent, prosperous Ukraine on Russia's borders. That would pose arguably the biggest threat to the corrupt, rotten authoritarian system that Putin oversees in Russia. And so Putin has tried to do everything he can to undermine that uh, system in Ukraine. But instead, I would argue, despite inflicting horrible and horrific damage on Ukrainians and the country as a whole, um, I think has actually strengthened the sense of national identity in the country. Ukrainians, first and foremost, deserve the credit, uh, but Putin unintentionally deserves a little of the credit as well. And I'll stop there, Roman. Thank you. Okay, David, thank you very much, uh, particularly the historical background regarding the Ukrainian-NATO relationship. But in that context, also, I think it's important that you uh, cogently outlined the falsehood of Putin's argument that NATO was a reason right. for the invasion of Ukraine. And we all know that uh, uh, Putin's desires went well beyond any kind of NATO relationship that Ukraine was going to have or not have, as you pointed out, given the historical uh, outline that you gave us. So uh, the other thing I'd like to point to is at the outset, you mentioned uh, the ethnic Russian vote during the um, December uh, 1991 referendum. Uh, it's obvious that the majority of ethnic Russians in Ukraine voted for independence. But I'd like to just take that story one step further, David, and that is that the, the rationale or the reason why people voted for Ukrainian independence, both ethnic Ukrainians as well as ethnic Russians, was they felt that they had a greater chance for a more successful and prosperous future in an independent Ukraine than with Russia. These people had experienced Russia. In the last 30 years, has proven them right. In those 30 years, Ukraine has made strides toward integrating with the West, building its democracy, opening up its markets. And what do you have in Russia? Russia continues to wallow in authoritarianism. So history is proving a lot of, uh, it's proving these people correct in terms of their vote. Anyway, I'd like to right now turn to Stephen Nix, who will try to uh, summarize everything and add some more context to our discussion this morning. Stephen? Thank you, Ambassador. Would you me No, ma'am. All right, our, our topic is a discussion of uh, the identity of Ukraine as a nation state. Uh, many of the speakers have, have made some excellent and very cogent remarks about this. Uh, I just want to start my statement, my opening statement, by saying that, uh, as previously noted, Russia continues to wage a military war against Ukraine and also continues to wage a major offensive against Ukrainian culture, language, and history. I'm here to say today, Russia is failing in both tasks. 
We all know about the successes on the battlefield. We expect that to continue. We expect U.S. assistance to continue. And I'll be happy to engage in that in the Q&A session if, if people want to discuss that. But I'm very confident about bipartisan support in Congress for continued assistance to Ukraine. But back to this sense of nationhood. Uh, and I'll go back to the data because I think the data is important. Adrian referred to it, David referred to it. Uh, the, the beauty of, of data, as our late chairman John McCain used to say when we would present data in Ukraine, it's like, this is not my opinion. This is not IRI's opinion. This is Ukrainian public opinion. And we need to pay attention. So, a couple of interesting numbers. Throughout the years in Ukraine, we've always noted, and you know this, various distinctions between the western part of Ukraine, central part of Ukraine, as opposed to eastern and southern Ukraine. Very distinct geographic differences in the responses that we've got, whether that was NATO membership, whether that was language, language, many other things. So let me just cite a couple of things because what we see in our polling data when we look at the data over the years is not just a drift towards the West, but also a convergence a sense of unity among the Ukrainian people, accelerated by the war, of course, but now a convergence in the data that we're seeing that there's now consensus on a lot of different issues that didn't exist previously. And I'll start with NATO membership, of course. We started testing NATO membership uh, once President Poroshenko was elected. Again, huge distinctions. In, the, in Western Ukraine, we had 60% support, Eastern Ukraine, 20%. Fast forward, we've done three polls for President Zelensky since the war started. Uh, now, 82% of Ukrainians want their country to be part of NATO. And again, previously we had 70, 80% support in Western Ukraine, but now we see this leveling off. This support is now universal. Uh, the first poll we did after the war started, um, the numbers were different. There's a 23% increase in support for NATO since the war started. And where's the change coming? It's all in the East and in the South. So now there's really uniformity in the numbers of supporting Ukraine. We also test language issues. We ask people about what's their preferred language at home? What was it and what is it now? The vast majority of Ukrainians speak Ukrainian at home now. Big difference in previous polls. So again, we're seeing this, not, again, not just westward orientation, but also convergence among public opinion, among all Ukrainians, regardless of their geographic location, which is really, really an extraordinary movement within Ukraine. While we're talking about data, I, I warned Vladko that I would veer off the, the uh, uh, statehood, nationhood uh, topic for a moment, just to go through some more numbers that I think are important for the audience to know. President Zelensky continues to have 91% job approval rate. We've done three polls. It's been 91%, 91%, 91%. It's incredible. We've never seen this before. Clearly, the Ukrainian people continue to rally around this wartime president. I've already mentioned the NATO numbers. Third point, which is very important, is that uh, the presidential administration wanted us to ask a question about what should be the outcome. What's the goal? What's the ultimate objective of this war? So we phrase the question this way, what should the borders of Ukraine be at the conclusion of the war that Russia has launched? Overwhelmingly, 74% say a return to the borders of 1991 with all that that implies. And again, that is uniform across the four geographic areas that we, we distinguish in our polling data. So again, you see this convergence and I bring up the border issue because this is an incredibly important point. Because if that's what Ukrainian people think that the objective in the end game should be, shouldn't that be the policy of the West? And I'll note in the EU foreign ministers meeting that was just held in Kiev, those ministers adopted, they voted and adopted President Zelensky's 10 point peace plan, which includes a provision that says the goal of Ukraine and the ultimate result should be returned to the borders of 1991. So in essence, the EU foreign ministers have agreed that this should be their policy. So our hope is, and we will encourage them to do so, to voice that as a policy of the European Union. Similarly, I think the United States policy should be centered in this. Again, the administration has been saying 
we'll stand in Ukraine as long as it takes. But can't we be a little more clear in our objective? I would argue we can, we should, and this should be the US policy so that all Russian troops are expelled from Ukrainian territory, which by the way, for the record, boundaries that are recognized by the United States and every country in NATO and the European Union. So again, I would sum up at that point and say, that should seem to be the policy of the collective West, return to the borders in 1901. I think that makes it the objective very clear. And by the way, getting to this notion about US assistance, uh, also, survey data in the United States shows that the more Americans receive, and more information Americans receive about assistance to Ukraine, the more likely they are to support it. So I would urge all of us to get that message out about what our policy should be so that it's more clearly known among the American people what the U.S. is trying to achieve with all of this assistance it's providing. All right, let's just move forward on a couple of things. So again. My main point is the data shows a convergence, uh, a sense of unity among Ukrainians that we hadn't seen before. Uh, I want to pay special note now to uh, the situation in Crimea because sometimes it gets overlooked in the discussion about what happens post-war once Ukraine is victorious, once Ukraine is rebuilding its country, its restructures, its democracy, its political parties, all of these things that need to be done. And I'll note a couple of things uh, that. Um, Crimea is distinct, we all know that because of its, its status. Uh, that status survives, it continues. Uh, there was a, a law on uh, the Autonomous Republic of uh, Crimea that was just entered into legal force a few weeks ago, again, which outlines the status quo, but also I think aligns Crimea more with current Ukraine. And I'll remind everybody that one of the biggest success stories of Ukraine's democratization after the revolution of dignity was its decentralization. And we have to remind people that in addition to EU membership, decentralization was one of the big demands made on the Maidan. So it has moved forward, it's been effective. In our view, this is one clearly one of the greatest achievements of Ukraine is conveying power to localities, conveying funding to localities so they can make decisions uh, on what happens next. And, uh, the data also shows that in post-war Ukraine, we asked who should make the decisions on what gets rebuilt and when. And the data clearly shows that the Ukrainian people would like those decisions to be made at the local level. And it's logical. The people in Odessa should decide which bridge gets repaired first, which road gets repaired first. Again, in consultation with the central government, we all understand this has to be done together. But again, local voices have a role in the decision-making process. So Crimea, I would argue, is somewhat distinct because Crimea did not undergo decentralization at the same level as continental uh, Ukraine did, per se. So that is something that's going to have to happen. Uh, and when we say decentralization, among the other things, it's not just decentralization of power, but amalgamation. Ukraine went through this huge restructuring of its cities, its rayons. <clears throat> And again, it's, it's been very successful in improving the quality of life of Ukrainian citizens. And we see that in, in the local data. Uh, when we ask people about localities, most Ukrainians are happy with their mayors and their city councils, the way they're governing, the provision of services, even during this wartime when electricity was shut off many times, public services couldn't be rendered because of, of, of wartime situations. So, Back to Crimea. Crimea will have to undergo the same decentralization process, uh, but I think special care and attention needs to be uh, shown on the Crimean process. Uh, the data also finally shows that uh, Ukrainians have very positive attitudes towards Krimsky And that's an important point. I mean, uh, Ukrainians, and David and others have said this, whether it's, it's different ethnicities, Ukrainians are very tolerant people. So the expectation is ethnic Ukrainians working alongside Crimean Tatars to create a new Crimea with special status. And again, uh, there's, there are a lot of things that have to happen. In addition to the restructuring of the building I pointed to, let's face it, when Ukraine regains control of Crimea, there's going to have to be justice rendered. There's going to have to be trials of people who collaborated, 
justice will have to be rendered. Decentralization will have to go forward. Uh, amalgamation and other things. Uh, but uh, uh, again, it's important that all Crimeans, regardless of ethnicity, work together to build a new autonomous republic of Ukraine. And the last thing is that means, to a certain extent, de russification whether that's language, whether that's schools, uh, that's an important point. Uh, Crimea needs to be returned to what it was, which is an autonomous part of Ukraine, an integral part of Ukraine. And part of that is focusing on Ukraine and not Russian culture, history, or language. I've run out of time, so I'll stop okay. there. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you very much for presenting the data, particularly the data regarding uh, Ukraine's unity in terms of viewing its territorial integrity and maintaining it, as well as uh, support of NATO and growing support of NATO. I think this kind of underscores David's point earlier that uh, the biggest aspect of Putin's policy has been that it's actually driven the Ukrainians more toward the West and toward unity. So I think your data kind of supports you know, David's uh, statement. Uh, also, I think everyone in this room would support your comments about uh, bipartisanship and the need for everyone to support Ukraine uh, and maintain that uh, support uh, until you know Ukraine is successful. I think that brings our uh, panelists panel uh, to a conclusion. I'd like to thank all our panelists for their very cogent and uh, you know, very important perspectives. I do think we have time for questions. Is that correct, Mr. Walter? Thank you very much. Well, I, well, I'm going to take the prerogative as being the moderator and start the first question. Uh, we've heard all our panelists and myself referring to all kinds of data that's been presented about Ukrainian unity, Ukrainian perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. But going on the basis of the old cliche that it takes two to tango, we all know how the Ukrainians view themselves. But the issue is, how do the Russians view Ukraine? We know that we talk about Putin as being an authoritarian and waging this war. But is there an underlying current of support in Russia? What is the Russian perspective of Ukraine uh, and Ukrainians and Ukrainian history? Uh, we all know what the history has been over the centuries. But what is the current state of play in, in the intelligentsia or in the common people of Russia? in their perspectives of Ukraine, Ukrainian history, Ukrainian ethnicity. So uh, with that question, I'd like to turn to our panelists. So if anyone wants to take a first, uh, Sidhi, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to add uh, some points uh, to Ukrainian unity. Um, uh, you know, that uh, we have some uh, terms like not only uh, we are speaking not about uh, only a strong Ukrainian civil society, but we we even uh, say about uh, Ukrainian armed civil society in this case. And uh, the, in time of the war, uh, we have effect of the strengthening of both of uh, Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian political nation. And uh, we remember, for instance, uh, the words uh, of uh, Mustafa Jamilov in time of uh, Revolution of Dignity, uh, who said that I'm proud that I, I'm Ukrainian, you know, and it's so, uh, it's so interesting and important for us. At the same time, you know, it's a uh, Ukrainian uh, political nation and Ukrainian civil society. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the behavior of Ukrainians in time in the very few days, the very first days of, of uh, full-scale Russian invasion, uh, in those days I moved from my, my flat to, 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 the, my, to my office uh, in the center of Kiev at Kiev Mahil Academy, and uh, because our university became a kind of uh, part of a defensive line, uh, you know, for protecting of uh, our uh, government quarter, and uh, uh, I uh, came back uh, uh, to my flat um, on the third day, uh, just for taking a shower, and all my relatives, all, all, all my neighbors were with, uh, with guns. You know, they were so quiet, and uh, you know, it it was very, uh, it very important for understanding that uh, Ukrainians are very confident in, uh, and this struggle for them is struggle for values, for European values, for democratic values. Ukrainians uh, feel uh, feel uh, like part of uh, the West, 
Western civilization. You know, it's it's uh, the struggle for values. It's really, really uh, very important. And uh, if we compare the behavior uh, of uh, Ukrainian society and Russian society, the problem is that we have completely different political cultures. And unfortunately, uh, you know, Russian society not only supports Putin or Putin's regime, but they really don't need uh, such freedoms, political freedoms uh, like uh, freedom of uh, speech and uh, freedom of choice. And the point is that after the collapse of, uh, of uh, the Putin's regime, uh, 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 you know, uh, maybe I think that Russian society will uh, start for after some uh, you know time they will start to look for the next Putin. You know, because uh, because uh, you know Putin. It's not like uh, uh, the, you know. First of all, it's not the pressure from Putin's regime to Russian society as a result that uh, they have autocracy uh, or authoritarian regime in authoritarian regime. The point is that. It's kind of a requirement from the Russian society to have strong leader and uh, you know authoritarian regime without any freedom of speech and freedom of choice. It means uh, that uh, we we need to to uh, we need to uh, pay special attention to the development or to, to changes in within a, a Russian political culture. That that is the point because uh, and I'm afraid if uh, if Russia. Uh, will not be destroyed on some different parts after and Russian will not have own state with own history own self-understanding uh you know as a russian uh, russian nation and not like uh, the history uh, you know uh, in connection with the history of empire the borders of empire and so on you know uh, we will uh, we will have similar problems in in, in the future you know, uh, who are the people uh, who, who, that we call them Russians? It's just people with Russian passports, but Chechenians are not Russians, uh, Buratians are not Russians, the parents are not Russian. Uh, that is why it's so complicated point. And uh, so uh, one more time that the, the main problem uh, is uh, the difference between uh, two political cultures from Ukrainian side, we, we have very democratic, you know, uh, culture, and uh, from the Russian side, we have so uh, uh, you know autocratic with uh, with such traditions, you know, and uh, uh, with uh, self understanding as a, as a nation of empire, not Russians, you know, as as a separate as separate people. That is why I I think that. Uh, even uh, after the collapse of Putin's regime, we will have some more problems if we we uh, we will not uh, influence uh, Russian political culture as a, as a culture related to traditions of uh, you know of uh, autocracy. And uh, this is the pro uh, this is the problem. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other panelists? Yes, make can I can I say something? Can I say something? Uh, uh, I'll uh, refer to uh, uh, readers to a piece I wrote a while ago for foreign policy, uh, asking whether Russia can become a normal European nation. And I want to just remind people that after the Soviet Union, as the Soviet Union was uh, collapsing, there was a fairly potent movement called Democratic Russia. It existed very briefly, and uh, imperial and uh, uh, security service forces reasserted themselves in the Russian in the Russian uh, political uh, political sphere, and that movement uh, quickly dissipated. But you know, uh, people like Galina Starovoitova, uh, uh, Father Yakunin, Lev Ponomaryov, these are all uh, Ostafiev. I mean, there was a whole range of people. There was an attempt, to, a brief attempt, it didn't take hold, to... Uh, to assert Russia as a as a nation state, as a you know predominantly Russian, ethnically Russian uh, nation state, the homeland of not the, uh, the, the, the uh, of of the Ruski as opposed to the Rasiski, um, uh, and uh, so that's one important uh, point that some kind of a cataclysm or a defeat can potentially jar more progressive forces. The second thing is that these two things are interrelated. Russia's authoritarianism is integrally related to this imperial idea. And I don't think you can, unless you are rid of one, you're not going to get to a stable other because a regime in, who, in whose head is this vast empire will continue to want authoritarian leaders to 
to reassert its its natural uh, existence, its uh, its destiny, so to speak. So these two things have to be addressed at the same time, both internally by Russia and by you know to the extent that we in the West can can uh, can do something about it. But then there's another example in the uh, mid. Uh, 1800s, uh, 1830s to 1850s, uh, Count Uvarov, the education minister, when Russia had again partitioned Poland, had a project to make, uh, a project called not Russificatia, but Urusienie, meaning to make Russians out of Poles. Uh, and that project failed miserably because there was a coherent nation that was resisting. The project of Urusenia today, of Putin's project to force Ukrainians to become Russians, is also going to fail precisely for the things that Steve and all of us have been talking about, this, this remarkable national consolidation around a, a clear identity, pride in the state, pride in the language, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things... I think mean that the that project, just as Uvaro's project, failed miserably, and there was no no progress of of poles turning poles into Russians. That that failed miserably. So too will so too will this project. But we definitely have to remind our leaders that empire equals authoritarianism. There is no other way around it, and that is why all the democracies eventually relinquish their empire. And I don't know which. You know, which one you, it's the chicken or the egg, which comes first. But I do know that the only chance for Russia to kind of go on a more normal path of development is for it to face some kind of a major defeat. Otherwise, this problem will perpetuate and continue in, you know, well into the 21st century. Okay, so Roman, can I just add one thing? And I, I'm, I apologize, I'm going to have to run right after I, I say this. i sorry for that. Um, but just picking up on what Adrian said, I agree completely that uh, defeating Russia obviously will be to the enormous benefit of Ukraine and to everyone else, but it will also be to the benefit of Russians. Um, and, and so uh, that is where I think we can have some impact. Whatever follows from the Russian defeat is up for Russians to sort out. It's not for us to sort out, but we need to make sure that it doesn't threaten other countries in the region uh, again. Um, second, uh, we, we should keep an eye, I think, less on what the Russian population as a whole feels and thinks, which is very difficult to measure in an authoritarian uh, society. Um, but keep an eye more on what the people, Russians on the front lines are thinking and how they believe the situation is going. The morale on the Russian side is very low. And at some point, there may be a tipping point where they say they have had enough. And if Putin doesn't have the guys on the front line to carry out his orders, then he's an emperor with no clothes. The last thing I'll say, and it's a phrase that became popular in 2011 with the uh, Arab Spring movements, is that these regimes seem stable until they're not. And you never quite know what the tipping point is that can produce a change. It, it, it is very conceivable that a Russian military defeat would be a tipping point, though I wouldn't necessarily count on it. People got excited about the Prigozhin mutiny and that didn't seem to last very long. Um, we, we, we will we'll know it when we see it and we actually may not even know it when we see it, we may know it after it happens. So I, I apologize, I have to run. My apologies to Walter and, and Roman, you, Steve, uh, Sergey, and, and Adrian, but thank you very much for having me. David, thank you very much for those uh, last comments and for being with us today. Um, as you can see, the comments the panelists made are worthy of a conference in itself. Very deep uh, and uh, provoking comments that they all made. But uh, we don't have time to go down that path. I would like to now uh, open this to the audience for any questions. Yes, yes, sir. With the historical nature, uh, my name is uh, Brendan Tomaszki, and my question is on the historical nature. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, a controversial one because it deals with the uh, First Ukrainian Division, also known as the uh, uh, 14th SS. And uh, let me lead into my question by first setting a couple of facts. In uh, 1939, Germany and Russia entered into the uh, Ribbentrop uh, Compact which basically they decided to carve up uh, Eastern Europe a bit. 
and um, Germany then invaded uh, Poland, and Russia then invaded the Western half of Ukraine. And they were allies at that point in time. When Germany decided to invade Ukraine and Russia, all of a sudden, Russia then flipped its uh, position and became a US ally. And in 43, roughly, the uh, Germans realized that they were hard pressed for military personnel and they started recruiting in Ukraine uh, a division to fight the Russians. Um, at that point in time, Ukraine was between a rock and a hard place because Ukraine knew the devil uh, of Russia, the WNO, but they didn't know the devil he didn't know with Germany. So there was that particular chance that possibly Ukraine could get its independence via Germany. And so they allied themselves with the German, uh, Nazi German nation. Um, we're being impressed with time, so can you get back quickly is uh, there is a state of guilt association with the Ukrainian division and Germany because of World War II. And, uh, but conversely, there's no guilt association in the states that the Russia committed during World War II, the atrocities then with the rest of the allies. You know, there's a, like I said, guilt of association with, with Ukraine, no guilt of association with the allies. How can that be rectified? There was no atrocities attributed to the Ukrainian division uh, during World War II, and that was uh, iterated with the Nuremberg trials with the Deschamps Commission, I think the uh, US OSI did say. Are you directing that to anyone in particular? In no, general, no, for an no. answer. Any panelists? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to speak about it. Uh, first of all, yes, the, you know, there, there is a lot of, uh, there is very little literature on uh, Russian or, eth or uh, on the collaboration uh, uh, between eth uh, ethnic Russian territories and uh, that were under Nazi occupation. But those studies that are there basically show the same kinds of patterns. There were some people who would resist, some people who were cowed into submission, and the levels of cooperation among all of these groups are not remarkably different. The level of cooperation of Russians with uh, Stalin uh, and Hitler is also matched by the collaboration of General Vlasov, who brought a million soldiers into the war on Germany's uh, side. And that is an issue that is not very often commented. As to the divisia, uh, look, I think you can make a case that they were not involved in atrocities. You can make a case that when they came into uh, formation, the Holocaust was fundamentally over and they were certainly not involved in the implementation of the Holocaust. But what is a, what was a mistake was to, to celebrate or to heroize participation in the division. Just as I believe it is wrong to celebrate participation in the Red Army, it would be right to say, you know, that people took part in the defense of their families and of Ukraine and of their civilization and of their culture and of their values, and they were heroic individuals in the war. But once you associate with institutions and institutions that have the brand SS, sorry, I just, you know, there were probably you know honest people who fought on the you know in the units of the you know uh, uh, Soviet security forces who were uh, uh, you know simply trying to protect protect their homelands. But there is no reason to celebrate the Soviet the glory of the Red Army. Nor is it would is it right to celebrate the well, there isn't very much glory of the of the divisia. They they were fighting on a losing side at the very end of a war, and they were mainly cannon fodder. So I never understood why there was this you know cult of of the divisia among former members members of the divisia, or that certain monuments uh, were uh, were put up. So again, this is not a part of the usable past. Uh, you know. As to collaboration and all of these things, you know, the U.S. collaborated with Stalin. There were not many moral choices uh, for uh, good people and democracies, even uh, at a time when there were there was this epic conflict with 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 evil, and there was evil on two sides of that conflict. The U.S. collaborated with the Soviets. The Soviets collaborated with the Nazis. I mean, everyone was tainted. So the real question is to celebrate people who were fighting to protect their families to uphold the idea of the independence of their country, but not, you know, specific institutions that were not Ukrainian institutions. These were not Ukrainian institutions. These were institutions created by the Germans and no Ukrainian should be celebrating a, an imperial occupying powers uh, institution. Uh, one more, I think we have time for one more question, yes sir.
Okay. Oh, just talk loud. No, uh, they can't hear you. No. Just talk can't loud. Hear the they can't hear you. The Zoom. The oh. Zoom can't hear you. Yeah, this is. Uh, oh, there it is. Hello. Okay. Um, my question is uh, primarily to Steve Nix, but if some other uh, analysts could comment about this, and this is regarding the Crimean Tartars. Uh, several weeks ago, an ethnic Crimean Tartar was appointed Minister of Defense of Ukraine. And um, in thinking about this, uh, this sends a huge signal uh, to, to the world, uh, especially to the realists out there uh, who constantly talk about Crimea being Russian, that Ukraine is not going to give up Crimea. And the leadership, the people who are running this war, you know, include uh, ethnic Crimean Tartars. Um, I believe that this shows the, the theme of the, these roundtables through, all, through the, all these years has been that Ukraine's quest for mature nation statehood. Is that not uh, uh, evidence that Ukraine has achieved that? I would argue resoundingly, yes. Uh, I did a TV interview in Poland recently, was asked about this question, uh, and I stated it this way, the fact that a Jewish president, a Jewish head of state, has appointed a Muslim, Crimean Tatar, to be Minister of Defense, in my view, totally rebukes this notion, this narrative Russia has attempted uh, to describe Ukraine as a fascist state, a Nazi state, totally refutes it. So yes, and, and by the way, just for the record, uh, Mr. Mehr was in parliament, as you know, uh, we brought him to Washington as part of one of the uh, seven delegations we brought uh, to Ukraine after the war started. Uh, he's a very capable individual, uh, and I think that he will serve his country well. And again, I just think the fact that um, by his ethnicity, uh, the Crimean Tatars are taking great pride in his appointment, and it just goes to, again, the uh, the unity of the Ukrainian people. There is no division, you know, muy uh, raz. There's no ethnicity divisions. There's no geographic divisions. This country is united, and I think this appointment uh, further uh, strengthens that premise. Yeah, and uh, may I add a few, just a few words? Uh, you know, I, I think in this case, in the case of Omero, I know him uh, personally. He's not just, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about representation of Crimea Tatars. He is very professional uh, and uh, he's a big Ukrainian patriot. He studied at Kim Hill Academy. And uh, that is why I think it's not only about, you know, the personality that he belonged to Crimea Tatars, uh, you know, uh, but he's really a guy who can uh, be minister of, of defense, I think, uh, in this case. Thank you very much. Just in time. No, we just we just think so. Oh, you just you're, finished. You're oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, I had to excuse myself. Uh, do we have time for more questions? Yeah. Oh, we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Uh, I have not so much a question as a comment. Uh, uh, as I was listening to the speaker and to the discussion right now. Uh, I was impressed primarily by three, well, primarily, I was impressed very much by three things. One was the importance of what is going on currently with the war and the shaping of a Ukrainian identity uh, and bringing the various previously fractured elements of Ukrainian society uh, together. Um, another one was the importance of, and it's related, uh, of the uh, cre not, not creation, but the um, uh, a fostering of a civic nationalism and not the uh, emphasis on the ethnic nationalism, which had its place in its time, but its time has probably passed and it's time to move on. Uh, but what I found a little bit missing uh, is uh, the part of the topic, which is molding a historical narratives. So that's what I would like to call attention to, and maybe ask people to think about it a little bit uh, more 
and how that would fit into these topics that we have heard right now. It seems to me that Ukrainian historiography now faces three main challenges. One is, and it's been mentioned, alluded to by uh, some of the speakers, is that there are these gaps, these uh, holes in Ukrainian historiography uh, because of the occupation, the policies of uh, restricting historical memory and that sort of thing. Uh, these gaps have to be made up. Uh, it's a very daunting task because Ukraine would have to be doing something that other national historiographies, such as French or uh, Spanish, had done not years, but decades ago. So there's a lot of catching up to do. So the second point is, because of the first, that the historiographies of other European countries have moved on from a simply national narrative to um, other topics. Uh, after all, how many biographies of leaders of the French Revolution can you bear to have you know, when you have that basically done you know, thousands and thousands of those? Uh, so uh, historians in Western Europe have moved on to the history of the family, the role of the potato in history, which by the way is not funny, it's, it's a true uh, historical issue and others. So Ukraine should not fall behind what European historians are doing. At the same time that they are making up for the gaps in, of the past, they have to join with their colleagues in moving forward. And the third is that because we've been emphasizing the civic nation, Ukraine is a civic nation and the ethnic groups, we have to bring in the historical narratives of the disparate groups, uh, ethnic, but also, you know, with, uh, other social groups, you know, they may be, you know, religious uh, as well, into the mainstream of Ukrainian historiography. A new Ukrainian historiography has to be created. And it's not simply having little additions, you know, here is chapter one, and then we have, you know, a couple of footnotes on what was happening in this community or that community. But there has to be a thread that links all these Jewish experiences, Crimean Tatar, Poles, Vyacheslav Lipinski, uh, the great historian, uh, was actually a precursor of a non-ethnic but a civic Ukrainian nationalism, being himself a Pole and a Roman Catholic. Uh, he was trying to integrate the Poles into the narrative of Ukrainian history. So these are some thoughts that um, I think that as as we uh, as we stated as we are on the war today, that we should also look back in the past and do the historical task uh, along with what we are doing in, uh, in the current situation. So, can I can I say something, Mr. Chairman? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, we have a, a Robert Bogochi's history of Ukraine, which, in a sense, tries to do uh, what uh, uh, what was suggested uh, by uh, Dr. Haida. But uh, and and but I think it is tough to give voice to all of this without a full discussion of of the of the of, U of Ukrainian history and a full examination of the you know. Eth the history of ethnic Ukrainians on on their historical on their historical lands, including the difficult questions of I wouldn't call it collaboration, but of service to the empire, et cetera, et cetera. And and, and there are a lot of questions that I think don't need to be politicized. I think it's okay to accept that there were a number of Ukrainian authors who were consumed by or uh, seized by or even deluded by the imperial ideology and were not uh, fighting for Ukrainian statehood. Their history is also a part of Ukrainian history. It has to be contextualized, but it should not be eradicated. And it should be, you know, it is a part of the Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian legacy. One, one last point about, uh, which, which I wanted to make, which is that Putin as the unifier of the Ukrainian nation. Well, he certainly gave some stimulus for people to rethink in Eastern and uh, Southern Ukraine, to rethink the thesis that Russians are a, 
a friendly neighbor and a historical, you know, fraternal, uh, fraternal people with whom we can live in prosperity. Uh, that that is that has certainly changed. But the point is not simply that Putin uh, changed that viewpoint. The point is that this population has, in a sense, has in in essence embraced the what I would call the national democratic narrative, which was a project less of the state, but more of, of human beings. And I think the only president who really embodied in his soul the national democratic idea uh, to this date has been, uh, was uh, Viktor Yushchenko, who has been maligned by, by many, but who was the, the only president in the history of the country that understood and felt fully the Ukrainian component of a of a of a civically minded nation and the fact that ukrainians are unifying towards something not just unifying against something makes it clear that that is the that is the basis of ideas that has that has in the end won and it has allowed and, and there was something for people to unify to unify around if there hadn't already been this cultural battle and historical battle waged mostly outside of the government uh, in in among scholars among the intelligentsia among teachers uh, it would have been much harder so so i want to give credit to all those people you know the real founding fathers of ukraine they're not necessarily the state leaders the state presidents they are these individuals who who uh, who uh, and and the you know civil society and the intelligentsia who helped propel this uh, this phenomenon. Well, thank you very much, Adrian. I think that brings our panel. Is it time? Oh, yeah, okay. I, All right, this definitely has to be the last question then. Go ahead, just very quick, because uh, we really don't want to touch what you've done this before. Yeah. Um, I'd like to address something that all of the speakers spoke to, uh, basically in, in the, the ethnic identity and uh, the cohesion uh, in Ukraine, uh, the, the strength of that, of that identity today. Uh, it, it is constantly threatened, has been historically threatened. Uh, I think of the uh, uh, regions, the ethnic cleansing that took place after the Second World War in West Ukraine with Poland, cleansing its territory and moving Ukrainians deeper into Poland. We see the same practice today. It's not spoken to sufficiently. We talk about, the president uh, Zelensky talks about genocide and that, but it, genocide, at least in America, brings visions of, of uh, furnaces and crematoria and that. Uh, there's another form of genocide, practically speaking, that, it, that is being practiced. We've seen it in Crimea. We've seen it in uh, in uh, Donetsk uh, and uh, in the Donbass region, and now in, in uh, Zaporizhia and and uh, Kherson Oblast. The depopulation uh, of Ukraine, some of it voluntary, which suits the purpose of Putin. Uh, he wants that territory, and he doesn't want Ukrainians in it. If he can chase them out with his armies, all to the good. If not, depopulate them, filtration camps, take the kids out of there, destroy the language. We can see that he's been doing that to the Tatars, to Ukrainians in Crimea, uh, the schools, the museums, the cultural destruction. That serves its purpose. Now, uh, in the US, the, the strategy of uh, as long as it takes, is not in Ukraine's interest. The longer as his army is there, the more that cleansing and Russification, and uh, to Adrian's point, the uh, Ur Ur uh, Ur uh, Russianization, uh, that's exactly what they're interested in. Uh, people for, for Putin's purposes, Ukrainians are cannon fodder. Uh, he wants that territory uh, for political reasons, uh, and if Ukrainians won't play ball, destroy them. He's got no problems with that. Uh, the reintegration of those territories post-war are going to be significant problems because of the depopulation that's already occurred. And the longer that's taken, we've seen Crimea now and Donbass, the more difficult that's going to be. So, you know, we don't pay enough attention to that. And uh, my problem, practically speaking, here in the U.S., when we have elements uh, speaking of, about territorial concessions, the uh, using the models of North Korea and South of the Korean models of Vietnam. Um, 
<laughs> those are or in Germany, East and West Germany. That doesn't work. That's not what the Russians are interested. They'll settle for that because they can really cleanse Ukraine in that process. That's not a viable model for us. Thank you very much uh, for those comments. Um, I think so that brings our panel to an end this morning. I'd like to thank all our panelists for being with us, as well as all the participants uh, in this conference. Um, did anybody want to have a comment on the comment? No, 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 no we're good. Yeah, okay, yeah. Right, I just want to make sure. Okay, okay, so Walter, uh, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to you right. as the MC and the coordinator. I just, uh, I, it's interesting because this time, I must say, I'm going to give a compliment. It's not just that the panelists have become very and they've remained very but the audience and the, the level of discussion from the audience is just very, very great. Uh, Actually, at some point, I think you uh, were channeling your own. You wanted to be, we were going to have you on this panel, but we put you in a different panel. But thank you for bringing up those as a historian, bringing up some of those issues. But again, you just can't get better than uh, if you have Ambassador Pupuduk running something, and then you have four of the panelists that we had on this first panel. Is that this is just aces all around. Thank you very much. I really, really, truly appreciate this. This has set the pace for a wonderful uh, um, conversation. So what I'm going to do right now is ask, but I'm asking for behavior. Five minute break of coffee because the next panel will have an extra speaker because we have Miss Deborah Kagan taking over that panel, but we're uh, Ambassador Herbst is adding himself at the end because he was at the State Department today. They grabbed him somewhere and he's coming in. So we've got five and so or six. So I'm asking everybody, go for the coffee, but please, unless you don't want to have lunch, <laughs> come back into the seat in about three minutes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Three minute break. Hey, Andre.
and what you're about to have. Um, and that is establishing a prominent role in the affairs of the Black Sea region, which is an absolutely vital question. Uh, we have joining us, Ms. Uh, Deborah Kagan. And I must say, man, that I, I was just absolutely delighted. She agreed to, in the last moment, having heard that Ambassador Herbst had not, was not going to be able to join us in time to be a moderator. He wants to be part of this panel. He wants to speak to this panel. Um, and so he asked Ms. Deborah to step in as moderator. And I'm just very, very grateful because I don't think we could have gotten um, anyone uh, sharper for that particular role. Uh, uh, Ms. Kagan is well known as an expert on the Black Sea. So Ms. Kagan, I'm just really very appreciative of the fact that you took over. Cuter than John, and, and cuter than John, too. Oh, well, wait a minute. I can't put that on record. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Shadow Moss rules. And uh, so, and he will be joining us. And, and, and Ms. Kagan also uh, asked me to just very quickly uh, talk about the individuals that are going to be joining us um, on her. You know, and I know that there are bios there, but I just simply want to say, Dr. Uh, uh, Elliot Cohen really needs very little introduction. Dean of, uh, of, of SICE, John Hopkins, uh, one, of, uh, one of the sharpest minds on, on generally uh, uh, geopolitical strategy and stuff, and, but also an expert on the Black Sea area, followed by um, the uh, president of Jamestown for nearly 20 years, I think it was. Um, uh, Glenn Howard. And Glenn Howard, actually, I think, man, uh, nobody gives him enough credit, but uh, I think he actually designed <laughs> that that crazy naval, those, all those crazy naval operations the Ukrainians are pulling off right now. Um, he's He's been known to have said that uh, uh, what happened with those sea drones is probably the equivalent of uh, the Mary Mac and the Monitor. And how pre prescient is that? Because it is, in fact, what's actually happening. Uh, the Black Sea <laughs> is going up against sea drones and the sea drones are winning uh, uh, the Black Sea fleet. So uh, that's Glenn. Luke Coffey, again, another individual who really needs no <laughs> introduction. Um, they had a long stint at the Heritage Foundation. I'm not gonna get into the politics or any of the other stuff that went on, but uh, was just absolutely the first rate and just about the top that you can get. And as luckily enough, Hudson um, Institute has now embraced him um, and really does know the Black Sea uh, region as well as the rest of the panelists do. And uh, that's going to be joined by someone who was the Minister of Defense and actually prepared, helped prepare Ukraine for uh, the disaster it was going to face in 21. Um, I credit him with a lot of the, the issue of the territorial design, uh, territorial defense design uh, in Ukraine. This is um, our, my friend Andriy Zahorodnyuk, Minister of Defense in 2019-20. Uh, and then finally, we are going to be joined uh, at the end by uh, John Herbst himself. And uh, I, of, of all those senior diplomats that the Ukrainians have, um, John, John speaks for himself. I mean, John is as good as they get. So that's the panel. Uh, Ms. Deborah, I think I did what you wanted me to do, and now you can take over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Um, and, and now we have a little bit of poor lighting here combined with my poor eyesight. So if I mess up on my notes here, please forgive me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just, just a couple of introductory words, and then I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk for about five minutes on wherever their passions take them on this. They all have great experience, and I'm not going to be presumptuous enough to tell them what they should and should not say. So let me just start by saying, when the world's most important military alliance neglects, forgets, and relegates to an also ran, one of the most strategically significant regions of the world, another country is bound to fill the void. For far too long, NATO focused on the vast bodies of water where many of its members live and ply their trade, but seemingly neglected this huge inland sea, which has been critical and strategic passage for thousands of years. 
those who live in this neighborhood have always known better. This impressive body of water and the inhabitants who are its crucial literal states have always understood that ceding control of any part of the Black Sea to a country determined to make as much of it theirs as possible would be a recipe for disaster. For Vladimir Putin, occupying territory in this region is a lifelong avocation, lest we forget Abkhazia. Those that live in this region have always understood the history that ancient people who went before them understood. This sea, this essential leak between the Mediterranean and the mouth of the Danube, mm -hmm. a confluence of different cultures, religions, and beliefs remains even more critical today than it did in ancient times. There are many here today who have argued for years that the US and indeed NATO have needed a comprehensive Black Sea strategy. I know Luke Coffey has written extensively about why this is so important and why we have never seemed to get this right. Glenn Howard has also written about the forgotten Black Sea. So we have no problems in focusing on the Baltic, the North and South Atlantic, and the Mediterranean, but somehow a huge body of water with three NATO members never gets the same attention. And now Ukraine especially, but also the other countries who depend on freedom of navigation, their inherent right to ply these waters for trade and transit are all under attack. I'm gonna conclude with just a, a dose of reality here. Um, before I turn to our guest panel, I wanna say lest anyone think that Russia's desire to control this waterway is just related to Ukraine, I wish to dis disabuse them of this notion. One of the most significant threats by Russia in the Black Sea is the use of untethered sea mines, which impair commercial shipping and indeed transit of any ships in the region. This is not by accident. Everyone, especially Russia, knows that these sea mines have already struck ships in the Romanian ports and territorial waters and near Bulgaria. Russia is confident that this will put a chilling effect on the desire of commercial vessels to use those sea lanes. And it knows that this means ships not just serving Ukraine, but NATO members in every other country in the region. This is not just about Ukraine, despite Russia's false narrative. It never was just about Ukraine. With that, I want to turn to our panel to give each an opportunity for some brief opening remarks. And I'll start with um, Minister Zaharadnuk. Andre, over to you. Deborah, thank you very much. And it's uh, great to see you and see everybody else, though online. I uh, was, I'm in Warsaw right now, Warsaw, Poland, and I uh, was speaking yesterday on the Warsaw Security Conference exactly about the Black Sea. So people started to and and this was the second time I was talking about the Black Sea on this conference. Last time it was last year. So last year we had about 20, 30 guests in the panel uh, of all conference, which had more than 1,000 people. Uh, today we had a massive huge room, which people could uh, not get because it was kind of oversubscribed. So we see a substantial increase of the interest uh, from at least from this region to the Black Sea situation. Uh, also yesterday... Uh, there was the uh, a speech of uh, uh, Minister of Armed Forces of uh, UK, which is basically a Deputy Minister uh, of, uh, of of Defense, uh, um, and he mentioned that uh, Russia suffered a, a functional defeat in the Black Sea. That was uh, that's what he said, and there's been a lot of these quotations of that in the, in the press later. Um, so certainly things are changing, and certainly things are. Um, uh, de developing, evolving, and uh, and the perception of the Black Sea is, is evolving. Uh, we see finally that NATO started to look at the region uh, in the strategy, NATO strategy 2010. Uh, Black Sea wasn't mentioned a single time. Uh, this time we see a new documents coming from NATO with Black Sea mentioned several times, you know, and uh, so there's, there's something happening. Uh, I have to say that we've been trying to uh, attract attention to the Black Sea problem for years. Uh, I myself had a, a meeting with the North Atlantic Council, which is the ambassadors to NATO from all country, from all member countries, including a general secretary, deputy general secretary, coming in October 2019. And we've been showing maps, we've been showing the uh, developments, what Russia was doing. Um, we basically outlined the whole plan of what Russia was 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 uh, contemplating uh, in the Black Sea, we clearly described that uh, they are still considering that they are owners of the northern part of the Black Sea. So the only country 
country which they are happy to share Black Sea with was uh, Turkey, uh, south south part, and that was it. Um, the, the rest they considered like their own territory, and uh, they don't feel any guilt, obviously, for anything they do uh, during this horrible war. But certainly, they're they're feeling like, and they're trying to project around the world that uh, uh, the the fact that they occupied the Black Sea, it's an occupation, is something else. So they're trying to rewrite uh, the international law, but more importantly, they're trying to create false perceptions in the audiences around the world. They they basically construct a new reality, which they're trying to sell to the rest of the world, uh, saying that you know the the international law is something else, but they actually they are entitled to more than international law says, and uh, that entitlement, that false entitlement, is very interesting to some other countries. They look at uh, a situation developing in the Black Sea and saying that, well, if Russia can do this with the Black Sea, why can't we do probably with something else? We have we have lots of evidence that uh, there's a, there's a whole number of countries around the world looking with a great interest to the developments there because they understand that it kind of redrafts the uh, the maritime security uh, of the world in general. So um, we are in a in a and we'll we'll talk about this later today. But we are in a very difficult situation right now because, as you know, Russia has blocked the so-called Grain Deal. Uh, they, in fact, they blocked us in a, in a, in a, in the Black Sea, uh, in a, close to the shore, and uh, announced that uh, they own those waters and they would attack or have a right to attack or harass any ship coming to Ukraine or, or from Ukraine. And uh, at the same time, they're enjoying uh, full freedom of navigation themselves. They're selling uh, enormous amount of uh, oil through the through the black through the ports of Black Sea and the grain, and particularly the grain which they stolen from Ukraine. So actually, like for billions of dollars. So actually, it's a it, this war because of this uh, transit. It, it turns into some sort of medieval type of a war when the aggressor is is using the resources from the occupied territory to fund their future operations. So basically, they, they they occupied operations. They steal in the grain. They're selling it. They receive profits, and they invest these profits into the buying more weapons and fun, financing further war. Uh, not talking about the fact that they send people from Crimea and Donbas to fight against Ukraine. So, um, so, so in this situation, uh, the rest of the world uh, is concerned, uh, but that's pretty much it. So, uh, there's been a number of attempts to broker a new deal. And it's not working out because very simply Russia is doing whatever it can. So if they can do something, they do it. Uh, so they can be only stopped by force. And that looks like the only thing which they respect. And that's on the ground and in a maritime domain as well. And so uh, a year ago on that conference, uh, I mentioned that uh, we're going to destroy the Black Sea Fleet. And uh, some people were smiling, were smiling, and some people were saying, "Yeah, sure." You know, they didn't smile this year. Uh, they didn't smile yesterday. They they kind of took it as the uh, as a as a very uh, serious uh, uh, sort of strategic consideration because that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, so we're going to be. That's the only option we have because clearly Russia is doing. Um, is is doing whatever is allowed to do. So the only option for us to restore the freedom of navigation. Since NATO countries don't want to get into direct naval engagement with the Russian uh, Russian uh, fleet, and that's why all those discussions about closing the sea, closing the sky over the sea, pol air policing, protecting the Black Sea with the uh, with the NATO forces, it's all good until until they realize that in the case if Russia continues harassment, they have to get into the and they have to engage against the Russian uh, ships, which means a direct war with Russia, and they don't want to do that. So essentially, uh, apart from massive military help, which we receive from our partners, for which we're very grateful, of course, uh, we are on our own. And uh, that's that's what that's a reality which we're facing right now. And so uh, we use all kinds of asymmetric methods, which we've been discussing indeed for years, uh, including missiles, including the drones, including sea drones, including all kinds of other drones. And there's a lot of different new solutions developed. Black Sea to date became the uh, the the theater for the uh, asymmetric warfare innovation, and that's a fact. And uh, yes, we have a lot of countries looking at that and 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 thinking where else what else we'll do tomorrow. Uh, Andre, but, Andre, but, you're preempting my questions to you. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> I, I had you already went into some of the answers to the questions right. I had for you. And oh, by the way, I forgot to congratulate you on taking out the Russian Kilo class submarine. That was awesome. 
watch watch this uh, area further. It's uh, you know it's just the beginning, basically. Excellent, excellent. Um, if if I can now turn to uh, Elliot Cohn. Um, Elliot, I'm sorry you can't be here in person, but look forward to what you have to say here. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you. It's uh, great to be with you. Great to be with a, a really distinguished panel of uh, all of whom I'm glad to say are friends. Um, I thought I would just uh, begin with a few comments on the war in the Black Sea so far and what are some of the directions that it that it points. So the first thing is, you know, this war, like uh, many other wars, is okay. actually composed of a bunch of parallel campaigns. So there's a ground war, obviously. There's economic warfare, which is uh, largely waged by Russia against Ukraine in terms of attacking infrastructure, although to some extent waged by the West against Russia in the, in the sanctions regime and some of the things the Ukrainians have been able to do. There's a war in the uh, uh, a set of campaigns in the information space. And then there's uh, the maritime front, which is what we're talking about here. And I think one of the things that's really uh, uh, so important about this is that the maritime front intersects with the uh, land front, because I think it's pretty clear that what Ukraine is trying to do, what Ukraine needs to do is to deny Crimea to Russian forces. And uh, that's important. That's critical for the land campaign. Uh, it's also as well as, of course, for um uh, Ukraine's access to the Black Sea. So that makes this this theater particularly important uh, and particularly particularly significant. Second point, just to reinforce something Andre said, um, it, this is a, a uh, it's been a campaign where we've seen really quite extraordinary technological innovation. And it has a significance that I think goes well beyond this, uh, will go well beyond this war. The fact that Ukraine, a country with at this point virtually no Navy, uh, is able to drive from its bases a um, a navy that, on, in paper at least, is pretty formidable. That's quite remarkable, and I'm sure that Andre is right that saying we haven't seen uh, the last of last of this, and and that will have some larger implications for the Black Sea as well. Third thing, uh, you know, it's interesting that the Russians have declared a maritime exclusion zone. Uh, around Ukraine, they've not declared a blockade. So the technical difference is actually a pretty important one because a blockade, you seal a country off from all neutral shipping and you're you're actually obliged if you've declared a blockade to enforce it. Otherwise, it's a paper blockade and it doesn't mean anything. And the Russians have been hesitant to do that. And I've often wondered why. And I think the reason is, you know, there are Ch there have been Chinese flagged ships. Mm -hmm. There are other uh, uh, ships that have been flagged by other countries that they may not want to interfere with, um, and that means that the Russians, I think, have some inhibitions as well, which are worth thinking about and and worth thinking about what uh, Ukraine could do about. In some ways, the most astounding thing about all this is that there is a degree of uh, balance, and and not just balance. I think the uh, British minister was right. Uh, what's happening is the Ukrainians. There's a story about this uh, just today. I think in the Wall Street Journal. Basically, the the Ukrainians are successfully driving most of the Russian Black Sea fleet out of Crimea and uh, driving it to Novorossiysk or even uh, further further away. And I think that, that leads me to the, my final point, which is, you know, but I understand we're supposed to talk uh, some measure about the future. It seems to me some of the future is a world in which this is one theater where there can really be a, a balance between the two sides. Um, you know, will the Ukrainians be able to completely overcome the Black Sea fleet? I don't know. That would be a pretty major lift, but you can certainly achieve some sort of balance. I won't be, I'm sure the Russians are going to adapt to uh, some of the challenges that they've uh, faced from the Ukrainians. But I also won't be surprised if at some point the Ukrainians decide that, um, you know, they're not the only ones who can have ships that get attacked. Um, and that I think has, you know, in a, in a war that may at some point run into some sort of stalemate on the land front, although I wouldn't predict that. And I, um, you know, I'm sort of for sure I wouldn't say it with a certainty that may also offer some opportunities for Ukraine as we move into the, 
the next phase of uh, a war that unfortunately looks like it'll go on into uh, 2024 and even beyond. Thanks, Elliot. Appreciate that. Um, Glenn, let's um, let's you launch into the subject and see what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I just want to point out, many of you, I'm new to Twitter. And if you're uh, happy oh. to be on Twitter, please follow me. I'm posting pretty much regularly about Black Sea security issues. I'm nowhere near loop standard, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm I'm a pygmy. Uh, what's the, what's the, the, the It's a hashtag Zach Glenn Howard uh, GH. So you'll sure. see my picture there and uh, and my tweets, and you can see my Financial Times article I wrote uh, last week. It's also posted there as well. So uh, on the swashbuckling uh, buccaneer in the Black Sea, Bodanov and his pirate fleet of drones. <laughs> um, so. Uh, but thank you very much for allowing me here. I, I think the, um, the Andre's reference to the uh, British Minister of Defense, uh, Grant Schaaf's comments at the Warsaw Security Conference are spot on. Um, what he said was is that we focused a lot on Ukrainian counteroffensive uh, in order to keep the direction. Uh, but the real success story is what's been happening in the Black Sea. And so today, as I posted a few hours, an hour ago, uh, reports that 14 Russian ships have pulled out of Sevastopol uh, and are now retreating to the confines of Novorossiysk. And so all of this is being done, um, all this is being done without a, a surface navy. Uh, and Ukraine is definitely with the use of its drones, uh, revolutionizing naval warfare. And I might point out that Rudanov is doing this uh, as an army officer. So you've got an army guy directing a sea drone fleet uh, and uh, be very successful in pushing them back. And that is really the success story. And I think more and more people are catching on uh, to what is happening. And so uh, what I wanted to do in my short presentation today would be kind of walk what's been happening. Now, we talked a lot about uh, Endeavor referenced the, the attack on the Minsk and uh, the attacks that occurred uh, in Sevastopol with the storm shadow. But the way the sequence has, has been, and, and, and timelines are really important when you kind of follow this. So last week, last Sunday, you have the news uh, that in the Times of London uh, piece that ran about the August 24 jet ski attack uh, on the Crimean coast, on the Ukrainian defense today. Uh, this certainly will be uh, a, a full-length feature movie at some point because uh, these jet skis uh, barked uh, 260 miles, refueling with uh, extra uh, fuel tanks supplied by five Ukrainian ships at sea. And in the background, you've got uh, the British SAS and SBS uh, helping the Ukrainians plan and organize this business. So it shows that you don't have to be there physically to help them. You just need help in planning and organizing it. But what's happened then in the sequence of events is you have the attacks on the S-400 and the Triumph radar system uh, in, in early September uh, that occurred in uh, Cape Tarkhankut, uh, which is a really important attack because what Ukraine was trying to do, and there is a strategy behind all this, is to take out Russia's eyes and ears with its radar. Uh, in, in the Northwest Black Sea. So the jet ski attack was also part of that effort. Uh, but the idea was is by hitting and striking these, and apparently the attack on, on the radar was done with S, um, S-200 missiles or adapted Neptunes uh, that were adapted for, for ground attack mode. Uh, what they did by taking that out is they took out the Russian eyes and ears. Then you have on September 12th, you have them, the Ukrainians recapture the Boyko gas rigs. Now, in the Boyko gas rigs, they have something called Neptune radar, which is monitoring uh, uh, Ukrainian grain ships coming out of Odessa. So, by taking out that gas rig uh, and the radar on it and recapturing it, now they're not going to permanently keep, keep hold of it. It's too dangerous. The point is, the Russians don't have it anymore. So, that reduced the Russians' ability to monitor the grain traffic that's coming out. Then you have the drone fleet attacking um, uh, the Russian warship Samsung was struck right on the September the 16th. Um, and then, so what you happen then 
Uh, September 13th, you have the storm shadow attack on the men's dry um, ship, um, landing ship in Sevastopol and in the Kilo. Now, we were all caught up in the headlines uh, about the significance of taking out those ships. But what was more important, and where did the sea drones tie into this and in grand strategy, is that these ships, the landing ships, and the dockyard there was taken out with the strikes. So Russia's ability to repair warships has now been extremely limited. So the, anything you send out of port now is a danger of getting hit. Now, none of these sea drones were able to take out and, and actually sink a warship like the Moskva. But what they've done is they damaged it. And when they're damaged, where do they got to go? Well, they got to go to a dry dock and they got to be repaired. Well, if you don't have a dry dock to be repaired, you either go to Kerch or you go to Nova Rossis. So this is a part of the grand strategy of what's happened, the sequence of events, where Ukraine has step-by-step reasserted sea denial capabilities through these strikes inside the northwestern Black Sea. And now what you have uh, on September 19th, you have the first grain ship with 3,000 tons of wheat, um, wheat leaves Trinomorsk. And you now you start to see uh, onesies and twosies, I call them, leaving uh, from Odessa with carrying with the grain. And the Russian Navy is now, as according a couple of days ago, British Ministry of Defense is pointing out, is the Russian Navy now is refusing to venture out anywhere past uh, Cape Tarkhankut. So they're, they're, they're back behind what they call the Crimean ledge. So this is really significant. To, now, whether it means anything, and the overall scheme about renewal of grain ships and is remains to be seen because there's also something called insurance and uh, risk insurance on these ships is very, very high. And so there's a danger to that. And so the risk is too high for many of these companies to resume it. But but this is, again, it's baby steps. It's efforts to show that they're able to do this. And if the grain talks are stuck, and apparently what I heard was that, you know, you correct me, is the Russians are wanting to free up and reopen the Odessa uh, Russia ammonia gas pipe or ammonia pipeline, and Ukraine is refusing to do that. And that, what I heard, was the sticking point of the grain deal being renewed. But if Ukraine can show that it's able to export grain uh, from Odessa without and push the Russian Navy back, uh, then that's a significant feat, and it might lead to a new grain deal. This is what I would say is very important. It's not resulting in uh, no more shaking strikes on Odessa. Uh, the calibers were being launched from some of the warships at sea. Those are continuing. But the point is they're pulling back, and they can't use any of shipping missiles to try to sink some of the grain ships. That's what the, that's the things to look at. Now, today, we woke up this morning. Uh, there was an attack on a Turkish uh, dry cargo vessel, the um, Kafkam Lier, uh, was attacked with a naval mine. Uh, and you do see uh, signs that Russian uh, Navy SEALs, special forces, are operating off the coast of Romania. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Romanians were complaining about GPS jamming of Romanian ships in their, in their, in their own uh, territorial waters by the Russians. Uh, so the war is continuing. It's not one, but Ukraine is, is certainly in this wave, in this round, uh, is succeeding. And I think it's a very critically important that we kind of keep looking at that. Uh, but it's also important um, that, uh, what was the date? September 25th, Ukraine announces that it has a 1,000-kilometer sea drone packed with a 250-kilogram explosive. Well, I'll let you do your math and where you can go with 1,000 kilometers from Odessa. And uh, I'll give you one clue. It begins with the letter N, Nova Rossis. Uh, so these types of drones at 1,000 kilometers are something to watch. And Ukraine is, is, is steadily moving out of area operations from Northwest Black Sea, now targeting the Crimea, not Crimea, but the uh, uh, Circassian Black Sea Coast Association. So this is really significant. The Marichka drone is the name of it, and it's very important. Uh, Ukraine has now four different types of drones at sea that it's using, and, and it is truly revolutionizing uh, naval warfare as we speak, uh, and it's being done on a, on a real, very, uh, on a dime, on a shoestring budget. Um, but sadly, Ukraine has spent $400 million on two corvettes that's building in Turkey that it won't see until the end of the, after the war is over. I would certainly, if I was a betting man, I'd put more of your money and resources uh, into the drones and the drone fleet uh, as, as, as the impact that's happening. Um, but I always am intrigued by what Budanov is doing and, uh, and, and how he's creating and how some of uh, 
the drone fleet is working. Uh, it's certainly innovative, but when your back's against the wall, uh, you certainly will do innovative and creative things. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Um, so, um, I also want to, uh, you, you briefly touched on this one, but I'm hoping Luke will talk a little bit about this. I've always referred to the Black Sea as Colonel Juan's bathtub. <laughs> and I, I'm, and Luke, you have a great deal of expertise in serious. I'm hoping in your remarks, too, that you talk a little bit about. Um, what's going on here with this Erdogan relationship with Putin and with Zelensky and everything else. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I want to echo everyone's thanks. Uh, Walter, thanks for inviting me back here to speak. Uh, Glenn, if I would take a few of those uh, new long-range drones, water drones you're talking about, and try to get one right up into the Volgodon Canal <laughs> on a moonless night... <laughs> Blow up a few locks in that canal and create a big problem in terms of, you know, we underestimate the importance of the Caspian Sea to Russia's force projection when it comes to the Caspian flotilla. And many of these ships are, you know, operating in the sea bays off right now. Uh, so anyway, it's a whole uh, another issue, uh, but just an idea. Anyone's listening. Uh, right. So the, the topic um, of this of this conference is looking towards the future. And then the, the specific panel, uh, this establishing a prominent role in the affairs of the Black Sea region. Now you've already heard from the experts uh, about the military security side of things. And it's hard to follow uh, the, the three speakers that have gone before me and the four speakers that have gone before me. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna focus more on the diplomatic side of things, which I think is equally important. I know that as Ukraine, um, to, to quote the, uh, <clears throat> the title of this conference as it um, matures nation statehood uh, to, de to develop a strong national identity is going to want to anchor itself into as many regional, intergovernmental, multilateral organizations as possible. And the Black Sea region is no exception. And luckily for Ukraine, they're either already a part of many of the important uh, intergovernmental regional organizations in the Black Sea area, or there's potential for them to, to join. So the most obvious one that comes to mind is uh, GUAP, the Organization for Democracy and Economic Development. When I say Guam <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., most people think of the island uh, in the Pacific Ocean. But to all of us in this room, we think of something different. And we see an organization, an intergovern intergovernmental organization of Georgia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, and Moldova. And since Russia's large-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, uh, this uh, this organization has been, um, I would say, motivated, inspired to do a lot more together. Uh, the statements that come out come out of the Guam Secretariat are always very strong, very tough, um, and this, and I could see a future where this organization. Um, enhances its status in the region, and the U United States should be encouraging this. In fact, Guam offers an opportunity for the United States to take advantage of Russia's uh, geopolitical equilibrium on the international stage. You, th you think about how Russia is just so consumed by what's happening in Ukraine. There are areas and options for the United States to take advantage of that uh, imbalance that Russia's statecraft is currently undergoing. And let's have, for example, a summit, a U.S.-Guam summit at the foreign minister's level to coordinate and work together on regional issues. The last time this has happened was 2017. Uh, so it has been done before. Let's have a U.S.-Guam summit. Another uh, area that's worth considering is the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, Ukraine uh, is now a participating partner in Three Seas. Um, to date, there are no... Uh, non-EU members that are full members of the Three Seas Initiative. Uh, I think this is, I understand the, the, some of the logic behind this decision, but also I think it's uh, this approach lacks creativity and flexibility when it comes to dealing with the, the geopolitical realities on the ground in Eastern Europe. So I think um, we should think boldly about what role the Three Seas Initiative can play and how Ukraine can play a role in this organization going forward. Let's not forget that the, the, the origins of the Three Seas Initiative was to um, enhance and improve interconnectivity in Eastern Europe from the traditional east-west flow to more north-south. And we all know from historical reasons why it was east-west, 
uh, and it needs to become more north-south, interconnected, uh, transit links, fiber optic cables, oil and gas pipelines, rails, motorways, et cetera. Uh, you cannot have uh, interconnected Eastern Europe without Ukraine. Uh, and we have this opportunity because of everything that's going on to get Ukraine fully integrated into this structure. Uh, so it's going to play a key role in the Three Seas Initiative going forward. And I think it's even worth discussing or debating or looking into the possibility of using the Three Seas Initiative as a organizing tool, a platform for future reconstruction in Ukraine especially bringing in the private sector. I know that's not the mission of Three Cs right now, but maybe uh, with some creativity, it could become a, a, a play a, a major role in, in reconstruction. Um, the other uh, area is the Black Sea Economic, uh, uh, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation mm -hmm. Council. And this was established in the early 90s, so very much a Turkish led initiative to enhance trade and economic relations amongst all the Black Sea literal states, but also countries sort of one, one state over from having a Black Sea coastline. Uh, the United States is an observer in this organization. We're not a full member. Russia is a full member, um, but because like the Arctic Council, since Russia's large scale invasion of Ukraine in February, 2022, this organization has done nothing. Um, right now, Turkey holds the rotating chairmanship. Uh, the Turks have acknowledged that there's not much they can do. Maybe it's time to rethink the economic cooperation and relationship with the Black Sea region uh, in a format that doesn't involve Russia, because it's just not realistic to expect that it can play a role in this region in an economic sense in a positive way anytime soon. Another area that Ukraine should uh, consider keep an eye on is um, the Black Sea Euro region. Uh, now, this uh, Euro regions are subnational regions across the European Union where cooperation is facilitated and encouraged at a regional and local level. There are dozens of these around the European Union. The Black Sea Euro region just includes coastal towns and municipalities along the Romanian and Bulgarian Black Sea coastlines. Obviously, if Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, when Ukraine becomes or of, of the EU, when Ukraine becomes a member of the EU, then uh, they should consider um, what role it could play in this uh, in this um, this uh, Euro region. And then finally, um, Deborah, you mentioned Turkey. I, I started my remarks by saying that Ukraine will want to anchor itself in as many different intergovernmental, multinational, lateral institutions as it can. The organization of Turkic states, I suspect, will be another one. Um, Ukraine has expressed interest before the large scale invasion of becoming an observer because of its ethnically Turkic Crimean Tatar population. Uh, Ukraine and Turkey have that very close relationship, uh, bilateral relationship already. Um, when I was in Kyiv several months ago, I asked every minister, every official, anyone who I was meeting with, uh, on balance, is Turkey helping Ukraine or undermining Ukraine? And every single response was helping Ukraine. Um, Turkey and Russia, let's put it this way. If, if Putin and Erdogan are going to really alter the course of uh, regional geopolitics and become closer together, then this will go against about 500 years of history of the region where Russia and Imperial Russia and the Ottomans were constantly at conflict and certainly in competition with one another, uh, almost uh, specifically over Crimea, going back to the late 1500s. Uh, Turkey pursues a very um, uh, pragmatic strategy in the Black Sea. It sees itself as the having a special and privileged status in the Black Sea for cultural, historical, and economic reasons. And there's no doubt in my mind that President Erdogan and those around him know that a weaker Russia, a weaker Black Sea fleet benefits Turkey. Uh, and they will pursue policies accordingly. Some of them we may not uh, like or understand, but that is going to be the, the reality. So when we talk about things like Oh, we need to renegotiate Montreux Convention. And this is a waste of time to have this discussion because it's never going to be renegotiated. If I was in Turkey, there's no way in hell I would ever want it to be renegotiated. And as a NATO member, as an American, I don't want Turkey to renegotiate it either. 
so I think we have to work with the turkey we have, not the turkey we want, and use that Ukrainian Turkish relationship as a way to enhance or perhaps even serve as a confidence building measure for improving our relations with Ankara. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and we're also honored that Ambassador Herx has been able to join us earlier than we thought. So you get to be a panelist. So your turn at the mic. Okay, I will speak briefly. <clears throat> One, because I am not as good on the Black Sea as my fellow panelists. And two, because I didn't have that much time to prepare <laughs> from being moderated to being a speaker. Um, let me talk about the American role in the Black Sea a little bit. Um, I think you're all familiar with the critique that many of us have of administration policy overall since Moscow, me, since Moscow launched its big invasion, which is that the administration has done in some ways an impressive job laying out all the factors that need to be addressed to deal with this, meaning armed shipments to Ukraine, strengthening NATO in the East, and big time sanctions on Russia. But that's the good news. And that policy has been enough to make sure that Putin could not win. But the news that's not so good is that ultimately that policy is merely adequate because we are not giving Ukraine um, all that it needs in order to actually defeat the Kremlin. And the, the current counteroffensive, which is now, what, four months old, has not gone as far as some people, not me, expected because we did not arm them to win the counteroffensive. The administration has been persistently slow and cautious in sending Ukraine what it needs. And I won't go into that now because you've, you're probably very familiar with the weapon systems that I'm talking about. The same approach applies to the Black Sea element of this war and more broadly, the Black Sea as a strategic zone. Um, sadly, the administration's caution has been evident not just for the world to see, but especially for the Kremlin to see. Um, they saw it before the big invasion, when we seemed to be about to send a destroyer into the Black Sea. This was after the Russian buildup in the spring of 2021, and we turned it around uh, before it ever went through the Straits. The Brits, to their credit, and consistent with their, their stiff upper lip, sent their destroyer in, and it cruised along the coast of Crimea. Uh, that was not even the most, uh, well, I'll use a, a appropriate but harsh word, eg egregious example of American caution. The greater example, and Deborah will correct me because I'll get this only partly right, was we were flying as reapers, reapers. Um, along, not too, not too far off uh, the territorial waters of both Ukraine, well, Ukrainian territorial waters, whether it's occupied Ukraine or non-occupied Ukraine. And of course, you all know what happened in that infamous incident where our reap was flushed down, flushed down by a Russian jet. And instead of sending 15 reapers right back into the same area, we, we dawdled and then we began to send reapers out, I don't know, 20 or 30 kilometers farther away from the coast. Meaning that we were, for the world to see, um, visibly intimidated by Kremlin military action. That's not a good look for a superpower, whether that superpower is defending or trying to defend its interests um, in Europe or anywhere around the world. To this day, we have not sent Reapers back to the area where ours was forced down from, which again sends a message. And the third point. Uh, which has been already raised, although not this element of it, concerns grain shipments from Ukraine and merchant shipments into Ukraine, I mean, in the Black Sea. Um, Jim Stavridis, a former SAC ewer, retired four-star admiral, had proposed not long after the Russian announcement of this maritime exclusion zone that basically NATO could oversee or the United States could oversee Convoys were operating almost entirely within NATO territorial waters to get stuff into and out of Odessa and Nikolaev. And the administration said no. One of many occasions where they said, we can't do X because Moscow might escalate. 
also not a good look for a superpower. So this is a problem which is actually not on the way to resolution, but it is kind of moving in the right direction because the administration sometimes after saying no to things says yes, but not on any of the three that I've just cited. Uh, there are things we could do even now without being bolder on the military side in the Black Sea. And Luke addressed one of them, but I, I wanna talk about it a bit more. And that's Turkey. Turkey is a very interesting international player. Um, Putin has assiduously courted the Turks since he came into power and with some success. Um, at the start of Moscow's war, 2014, when the Crimean Tatars were not being handled with kid gloves, Turks really did not stand up for them. Um, and Turks were sending their ships into occupied Crimea when others were not. Then Turkish policy pivoted, in part because of Moscow's aggression towards Turkey in the Middle East, the famous shootdown of the, the Turkish shootdown of a Russian jet, the fourth one that he got went into Turkish territorial airspace and Turks were warning them each time, complicated the Russian-Turkish relationship. And the Turks decided, and this is where Luke's point about the support they've given to Ukraine, and they've been more helpful than not, why providing drones, which the Ukrainians have used to good effect, especially when we were, we're not even sending them javelins. You know, now we're going back to 2016, 2017. We only finally sent javelins. We only agreed to send javelins at the end of 2017, December. Uh, but there's more that can, and I think should be done. I, I believe that the, the Russian restrictions on maritime moving the Black Sea is also not quite in Turks, Turkey's interest. And I think we could be doing more to pull Ankara onto our side on this issue. But of course, we'd have to want to be bolder. By the way, by the way, NATO and the United States were not actively supporting Turkey after they shot down that Russian jet. So the timidity of American policy in Ukraine was predated by timidity of American policy elsewhere. Uh, anyway, one, we should correct that. We should acknowledge our mistake and say, henceforth, no more. We should finally give the Turks the F-16s. We'd also tie that to Sweden joining NATO, and maybe some cooperation in Nagorno-Karabakh or in the South Caucasus, but we should, we should offer that to Turkey. And we should begin a serious strategic dialogue with them about how the Black Sea in the current circumstances can be made more secure. But we have to partly pay our way into that with again the F-16s, although not for nothing, it's not a goodwill gesture. We, we negotiate the terms right up front, and also acknowledgement that you know, maybe we weren't such great allies back in 2015 when the Russian jet went down. So with that, I think I've been provocative enough. And I, I thank Deborah for filling in, but better than filling in, um, outdoing me as moderator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, so I want to, there's a couple of things I want to unpack here. And instead of like calling on people, like you're some sort of school marm, I would rather just throw out a couple of things and then have the panelists let me know when they want to talk and comment on this, because I'd rather have a dialogue than just, you know, this sort of, let me hector you into saying something. So I'm going to throw out a couple of things here. First, um, we're looking at the future here. So the first sort of thing I throw out here is that is it too late to fix what is broken? There's a lot broken here. So let's start with talking about what are the vital actions that can be taken in the immediate future? And then we, we've talked a little bit about the further distant future, but the immediate future of fixing these things. And there's, so there's a couple of, of baselines I wanna put out here. So short of, of, of taking the entire Russian fleet in the Black Sea down to Davy Jones's locker, which would be you know, a nice alternative here. What else can be done so that Russia cannot continue to control freedom of navigation? Um, and then John mentioned the Reaper. Um, do, you, do, that, do the, any of the panelists think that Russia has anything to fear from the United States or any country in NATO since its reaction to a couple of things, not just the takedown of the Reaper was 
nothing happened, but also um, these floating sea mines that have menaced, you know, the port of Costanza for some time here. The, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Russians stopping everything, including Turkish flag vessels in um, from plying their trade in the region. So what can be done to uh, change Russia's control of those sea lanes or the Sea of Azov, et cetera? What, what, what are the alternatives here? And then, um, and then one other thing about Turkey here, um, which is that Turkey has a huge new gas fine coming online. Right now, it depends on 40% of its uh, gas from Russia, and it's the upstream provider for Turkstream as well. But that will change. That will change probably within a year. And is that something else that can be exploited to push Erdogan a little further away from Putin and, and give him sort of what he needs is that independent energy independence to do that. And finally, um, the last part of this is we've made mistakes. Um, as Luke pointed out, as John pointed out, the United States went on this isolationist binge toward Erdogan. In the earliest days of this latest part of the war, every NATO ally was called by this White House except for Erdogan. They left him off the list. Why you would leave the controller of Montro off the list is beyond my comprehension. Mm. So there are some things that have been expressed here, how you change the dynamic. So I throw those, those are my little unpacking things that I throw out here. And then I'm asking the panelists to just let me know when you want to talk. And I can't see all of you um, at the same time. So um, feel free to bellow. Well, can, can I, if I could just throw in one thing, I mean, the obvious thing that we can do is give more long range precision weaponry to the uh, Ukrainians. And although I don't believe that any single weapon system uh, is going to be decisive, there's no question that, you know, if the Ukrainians had attackums with, uh, particularly with unitary warheads on them, they could do a heck of a lot more damage to the uh, Black Sea fleet. I think there's a, um, and in general, helping Ukrainians with the, the kinds of technologies that they've invented on their own and that have been very successful. You know, I think one thing that is a, um, a positive development is the Ukrainians have repeatedly shown, uh, in, and indeed in a way the British and French, that you can do things that the Russians keep on telling us are red lines and then the Russians don't really react. And that's particularly true of the attacks on Crimea where there had been an enormous amount of bluster about that from the Russians. British and French have been uh, uh, providing Storm Shadow and Scalp, which are basically the same missile, uh, you know, and and nothing. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all agree with this, uh, uh, and, but it does bear repeating. We, we can do more that way. I think the other big decision that will have to be made at some point will be by the Ukrainians, though, and that's whether they want to begin inflicting pain on Russian shipping. And I don't know if Andre wants to speak to that, sure. but at the moment, it's you know part of the asymmetry here has been uh, that it's the Russians get to go after uh, shipping heading into Ukraine or heading from Ukraine, but with one or two exceptions, what the Ukrainians have confined themselves to doing is attacking uh, Russian naval forces. Uh, there, there is, I think, there was one uh, ship that was headed to Syria that they attacked, but. You know, that may very well change the calculus in any of a number of ways, and it could also be high risk. It's probably the sort of thing you want to coordinate with your allies before you do it. But that is that it would, I suspect, change the dynamic somewhat. Andre, you want to pop in here? Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, so we've been discussing attackums for uh, more than a year. And uh, for over the half a year, there's been hasn't been a any explanation now why they're not provided. So there's been various explanations on all kinds of other weapons. Uh, but for some reason, we still don't understand what exactly is the uh, is the problem. Um, and uh, yes, we do apply uh, the storm shadows and the, you know, a similar weapon to on Crimea. The thing is that, uh, again, we're constantly hearing uh, some sort of irritation when we get to Crimea. Uh, when we talk about Crimea, when we when we address Crimean uh, Crimean targets and so on, 
and uh, when we do anything in Crimea, and uh, partly this because this is because it's uh, it's it's like we are diverting attention from the counteroffensive somewhere else. Well, uh, it it takes no, I mean, not much knowledge to explain the the, the importance of Crimea for the for the for the counteroffensive, and generally for the whole war. Crimea is the uh, massive military staging ground and uh, and and the ground for creating for for, for generation. And uh, uh, by the way, I would like to suggest that you know Ukraine keeps, keeps the website called blackseanews.net, which is supported by international community, international donors. And this uh, this uh, this website is keeping an exact record of all of all uh, breaches of international law and all shipment in the Black Sea by Russia, and every single rocket which was sent from uh, from the Russian ships to Ukraine. So um, uh, for 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 nine months of 2023, Russia has been sending caliber rocket uh, in approximately one per day, 26 per month uh, from uh, Black Sea ships to uh, Ukrainian cities. And since Kiev is the only one city which is uh, reasonably, we can say, protected with a, some some kind of a dome, uh, because of the because you know there's been an enormous attacks on Kiev over the last few months, and uh, none of the rockets had hit any target. The only the only damage was from debris from the from the remains of the rockets which were falling on the people's houses and so on. Um, but uh, but the other cities not, and particularly Odessa and particularly Kherson and and, and the others. So every time when Russians sending rockets, it means somebody dies, uh, or, or or some horrible damage and so on. And they doing this every day uh, in in uh, in average. So we uh, for us it's a, it's uh, the addressing Black Sea and Crimea, uh, uh, you know, as a, <clears throat> it's 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 critical for survival of the country. It's critical for counteroffensive the war and so on. But we're constantly hearing from some politicians that you know international politicians, those guys like, why are you doing this? You you better focus on something. And it's uh, operationally is wrong. And uh, I suggest that if 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 uh, if United States embraces our uh, our like uh, you know, campaign plan, which includes Crimea, uh, that would be great because then we can talk about some specific weapons, specific systems, and actually specific uh, specific operational plans. Currently, it's not happening, from what I know. Thanks, Glenn. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Andre, who was um, a pioneer when he was uh, Minister of Defense in trying to get Snake Island under Ukrainian control. And the problem in Ukraine is that there's this continentalist thinking about naval warfare uh, that has been inhibiting their strategic thinking. And Andre uh, was someone that challenged that assumption and, and tried to convince Zelensky to go to Snake Island. Um, so. A lot of this is changing in, in terms of the mentality. But the thing I, you asked about um, um, was what could we do now that, that could be different? And, and I, I want to commend uh, this, the Minister of Defense of Britain. Uh, Grant Schaaf said two weeks ago he made a comment and he was forced to, to pull it back again uh, about the role of the RAF in the Black Sea. And what when he made a statement about the RAF needed to be involved in, in protecting the grain convoys, really, uh, it really caught a lot of people's attention. But then, sadly, his instincts are right, and his staff said, "Well, you can't say that, you know, and it's provocative." And so, but what it reflected, I heard, was a thinking that for the policing mission that's flying out of NK, NK Air Base in Romania. I won't pronounce the name in Romanian, but uh, MK Air Base, um, is that the Brits were rethinking rules of engagement in the Black Sea, as uh, Ambassador Herbst was alluding to it with the Reapers. You know, we had one shot down, and what's our instinct? Well, we pull everything back and, and, and engage in self deterrence again. And so, but the Brits were, um, what Shaps' statement reflected was, uh, a, a role for the RAF and in protecting the grain convoys. I mean, my God, how many grain convoys, how much, how many convoys went to Murmansk in Second World War, PQ-17 on down? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, there is an allied role in the Black Sea for doing something to protect this. Uh, and Ukraine's kind of doing it all on its own. So uh, that's where I would throw that out there, is it that we need to th rethink kind of what we're doing 
And at least the RAF was was toying around with that idea, and uh, and I hope they keep kind of rethinking. And and, and Britain, in many ways, was taking the lead in the Black Sea, which uh, I'm afraid the United States isn't doing. I'll just add that the the most immediate and effective way to enhance maritime security in the Black Sea is um, not to dwell on the fact that we can't get ships through the straits into the Black Sea and, and uh, how our reduced presence impacts the situation, but instead focus on building the capabilities and capacities of the countries that are already there. Um, through the asymmetrical means uh, with the, some of the advancements in coastal defense and these maritime drones, but also building out traditional um, uh, capabilities on the naval and maritime front. And, and think, uh, you know, laterally as well, including joint training, officer exchanges and education, these sorts of things. Uh, and but one point I wanted to raise uh, just really briefly is, um, you know, we have to start thinking about uh, occupied uh, Abkhazia as well, because it was reported today in the press. And, you know, who knows if this will be confirmed or if it's going to happen or what. But nevertheless, it was, it was reported that. Russia is considering uh, establishing a, a new naval base there because it's losing its, you know, safety uh, in occupied Crimea. And how do we interact with Georgia uh, with this current government um, that has shown a certain reluctance to antagonizing or step, uh, standing up uh, to the Kremlin? Um, you know, what does this mean for uh, regional security if, if this happens? I think these are questions that we should start asking now. You know, before I turn to the audience here, and I see your hand up there, I just wanted to make talk about thinking out of the box here. Um, you know, Montro is an interesting convention. It has a lot of things that are written in stone, but it's also heavily nuanced. And I think it's worth looking at because countries that are Black Sea nations can move military vessels, warships in and around the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely permitted under even the most illiberal reading of mantra. Um, one of the discussions I had with some of my Romanian colleagues, for example, is instead of having a NATO country come in with a warship who's limited by their transit, limited by the time they can spend in the region, why don't we have some NATO countries lease you these ships for a dollar for a year. And then you, Romania, flag the vessel, you, Bulgaria, flag the vessel as your own, and you can start doing your own freedom of navigation in the region for yourselves. I, I think we haven't, I, I was only half kidding when I raised this with some senior Romanian colleagues, but I think this is worth looking at. Uh, Romania could not even get an Italian minesweeper to come in because Turkey wouldn't allow it to pass through the Straits to do this. But why not have Italy lease that ship to Romania for a dollar a year so that it becomes a Romanian ship? And then it can pass through the Straits and ply that waters. So when we're looking toward the future, I would look at creative ways to work within the parameters of what Montro has to say, because if you're part of that club that you live there, you're allowed to do a lot more than if you're not doing that. So I throw that out there. John, before I open it up, do you have anything else to say? Okay, quickly on, sure. on that point. Um, you know, Turkey Turkey is using Article 19 of Montreux, which um, closes the straits to those navies um, involved in, to belligerent navies. So in this sense, Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, it's basically an understood agreement that non-Black Sea NATO countries will not ask to go into the Black Sea. Um, there's a separate article, I think it's Article 17, I could be wrong, that, that covers a blanket sort of ban. Uh, and so Ankara is not asking for this, they're just hoping that no one's going to make a, a fuss. Um, but I think eventually someone's going to have to probably make some sort of fuss. Uh, because I don't see how this position is, um, is sustainable. And one other creative way that um, uh, to consider is there, there's a treaty, uh, 1948 navigation of the Convention on the Navigation of the Danube or something like this. And um, this, this states on what ships can go where on, on the Danube River. And 
you can send naval ships on the Danube if you're a Danubian state and you get permission from each country that's a Danube state uh, to transit through their section of the river. So in, in theory, if you look at what the river can take, um, the only country outside of the Black Sea that has mine sweeping capabilities is Germany. And you can actually, through a series of canals, get uh, German uh, minesweepers onto the Danube that could transit down to the Black Sea, but then you have to get Serbia and Hungary's <laughs> position. But I think it, you know, deals can be made. They've been made in the past. Uh, but, but again, if you want to think like outside of the box, uh, you know, how, uh, it would be amazing to see, a, you know, a, a, a German uh, minesweeper right. operating in the Black Sea. And the, and the UNCLOS Convention, the updated UN Law of the Sea Convention, also provides for quite a bit of maneuverability here. And I don't think people are looking at it as closely because it really has had great implications for oil and gas fines and who owns what. Um, and it delineates much more carefully what Ukraine owns versus what Russia would own in those waters. And it's just another convention that people are not looking at carefully in this regard. Now, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions, please. Sir, you've had your hand raised. Yes. Microphone. Thank you. Thank you. No, still on. Is it on? Is it green light? It's flashing. Ah, there you go. Can you hear now? Thank you. Um, Can you identify yourself, please? Yes, Bogdan Hetmanski. Um, you mentioned the uh, Marichka drone, uh, sea drone with extended range. Um, my impression right now is that Ukraine is fighting with one arm behind its back because it can't reach out and touch logistics centers far into Russian territory, which are supplying the uh, war effort in Ukraine. What is the possibility of Ukraine taking? say examples of the uh, Scout Shadow uh, cruise missile and re-engineering the um, engine system so it gives it extended range to reach out and touch and send love letters over there to uh, those centers to let them know that uh, they're uh, vulnerable. I, I, don't, I, I don't know the precise details of the engineering and the science behind the Storm Shadow and Scout, but it is my understanding there are two variants. There's an export variant and a variant that's in, in use by the UK and the French. The export variant has a, uh, a shorter range, but we don't know which variant the, the Ukrainians received. But I think it would probably require a rework of the, I think you just need a new missile um, full stop, uh, as opposed to like tweaking something to make the range a little longer. You have to also remember that these weapons are air launched um, and they're done so from a standoff distance. But, you know, when we're when these were being launched into Libya in 2011, it wasn't really an issue. Uh, but it is an issue now because and that's one of the reasons why the, the argument about, oh, uh, well, the Ukrainians don't need attack ups now because they have storm shadow. That doesn't hold any water because you have to get a very expensive plane up in the air close enough to the front line to take advantage of that full range of the storm shadow. And that's risky business uh, and the, the stakes are high. Um, so I, I don't know if that's technically possible, but I, I, I doubt that it is. I think we probably have to find other solutions to their needs. Yeah, one other, one other point on that. Um, there, the, it's not just a software tweak. Um, it's more complicated than that, but more importantly, Luke hit the nail on the head. It is air launched. Um, the only aircraft Ukraine now has that can carry these um, that are similar to the Tornado is the Su-24. And, um, and when you do not have air parity, let alone air superiority, that also uh, has implications from how you use these systems, as Andre knows quite well. Um, other questions? Yes, uh, please, the gentleman in the corner first. I can't see. Thank you. Um, my name is Yaroslav Martinuk. Um, from what I hear, there's a general agreement that Turkey is a key player in the Black Sea. 
And it's, in my opinion, Turkey is a key player because of its control of the straits, Dardanelles and Bosphorus. Now, um, so far they've been adhering, compiling with the Montreal Treaty. But uh, something that uh, Glenn Howard mentioned, there was an attack on Turkish vessels that we that I know there probably were others and mines. My question is, what would it take for Turkish to, Turkey to close the straits to Russian shipping? And is that likely is that feasible? They already did under the under yeah, no, I think he means commercial shipping. Yeah. Turkey would have to, according to the treaty, Turkey would have to be a belligerent in, in the war, then it would have the authority to completely close. Right, right. And then one other point, um, they did not close the straits to Russian military vessels. They only closed the straits to Russian military vessels that were transiting from another port. So as long as those Russian ships had a Black Sea port as their home port, Turkey did not close the straits to those transits. Only when Russia was trying to move um, ships from the Far East and say, and then rename them as Black Sea ports, that's when they closed the straits. So that is, um, it's a very, very, very strict distinction under mantra. Sir, next screen. Hi, my name is Adir uh, Piachak. <clears throat> the mention was made a couple of times about uh, how important finding the enemy to be defending war. Sorry, your microphone is kind of off. Battery died. It's back on now. It's back on now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Darian Yacha. Um, mention was made about how important Crimea is to the Ukrainian war effort. As a matter of fact, it's crucial because it's become the, uh, the staging area for the Russian war effort. At the same time, there is an implication that the United States, um, that the current administration, um, is playing it cautious and slow what they, as they have been for the entire Ukrainian war effort. Uh, is there a special consideration or a special caution that the administration has to with regard to Crimea? Is it something equivalent to don't, um, don't attack Russia proper? I mean, not to that extent, but is the United States in a way pussyfooting when it comes to Ukrainian efforts in Crimea? Uh, <laughs> we there was an article in Politico in the middle of February, which said that uh, Secretary of State Blinken told a group of think tankers in a um, group phone call that there was reluctance on the part of the administration to send uh, attackers to Ukraine because of concern that if Ukraine was on the verge of taking Crimea or making difficulties for Russia and Crimea, that could lead to a significant escalation of the war. And I'm citing that because I can tell you that article is not wrong, but I'll say no more about it. You say it's not uh, wrong. Not wrong. Okay. I, did not, I did not depict that conversation incorrectly. Uh, there are what we've seen since then have been uh, extraordinary, comma ingenious Ukrainian attacks on Crimea, which somehow not led to a major escalation um, from the Kremlin. Um, we are consistently hearing lately, and by lately I mean the last few weeks, that the concern that was described in that political article no longer obtains. We're hearing this. But what we have not seen is, to my mind, the logical consequence of that statement, which would be a decision to send, especially attack them with a range of 300 kilometers to Ukraine. 
So the bottom line, uh, there has been a tendency by the administration to treat Crimea kind of like, but not really like Russia, because everything else they say points in the other direction. But that may be weakened. We'll see in the movie, so we kind of and working towards that end. Not, um, I don't want to touch the regime because I, it's doing so well on time. But I'm um, going to, I please. I think we're going to touch the regime because we're doing so well on time and we actually could have this done, done um, on time. But I am going to follow up on that question because I think I'm about to hit the third rail on this. Uh, and that is on Crimea because all of you specifically said that there seems to be some sort of or has been some sort of special relationship um, develops about or special uh, paradigm with, when it comes to Crimea, that Crimea is sort of more off, you know, but that's something that the Americans don't often. I think you and that group that you've had in the chat uh, have been talking about that. Why not Crimea? I mean, General Hodges, we love Clark, will be here today, so they were, were talking today. They've all been stressing, why are we so hesitant about Crimea? Ambassador Herbst has explained that there seems to be something different about Crimea. I'm going to ask that question. Have they, because there are, there are fanatics, there are fanatics in Russia that are talking that nuclear testing is back and so on and so forth. Is there something, and am I right to go there, or should I not touch this thing, that the Russians have said that they were going to do something stupid um, or, or or show off something stupid. And that's why we're so careful about Crimea. And is that, ch and again, the second question, is that changing now that the Europeans are saying, I've, I've heard that the Europeans are saying, well, we believe in full sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. So that means the food's Crimea. So, double question, and I shouldn't ask that question at the end. Sir, because this is the whole conference yeah. itself. If I could turn to our virtual, uh, First, to, to answer that, um, because I know both Andre and Ellie have yep, been answered. Off. So, Ellie, do you want to take the first crack at this and then Andre? Let me ask Andre to uh, to go first. I want to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Um, so, first of all, indeed, there hasn't been a, a formal uh, restrictions on using any weapons on Crimea. Uh, however, uh, let I mean to answer your question, we need to we need to raise a little bit further, and we we can say that uh, United States administration so far haven't endorsed a Ukrainian victory plan. So essentially, um, there is no there is no overall understanding, joint understanding where we're going with this war. Uh, there is a plan about the counteroffensive, supporting the counteroffensive. There is a statements about uh, supporting Ukraine as long as it takes. And then there is a massive gap in like what, what what actually do we mean by this? Ukraine has a very clear plan, which includes Crimea, uh, but the word victory was mentioned only once uh, by uh, a policy, U.S. policymaker. Uh, it was a uh, Lloyd Austin in uh, April 26, 2022, in the first Rammstein meeting. That was it. After that, there was like this topic was avoided because there is no understanding how we can reach uh, reach the end game. And Ukraine says, well, yes, there's, there, it's difficult, but we don't have any other choice because, because unless Putin fails, and it, it happens very visibly and very clearly, uh, he will be trying to continue. And he may even try to continue after he fails, but this certainly will be massive threat uh, unless he fails. And, there's been, and there has been a, a, a remarkable uh, silence on that from, uh, from, from, from DC in, in terms of like administration. So we uh, and that, and and that's why the people are saying that well apparently apparently there hasn't been an appetite to support Ukraine in some areas of the of the concept of victory particularly Crimea and for us we think it's 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 absolutely essential for the reasons we described but uh, there hasn't been any uh, policy which we know about uh, about that and um, and 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 any public communication about this so, and that's uh, a problem. And that's a big, big problem, which we're trying to deal with for like more over a year. So I'll just add to that that I think um first in general, the, the administration's decision about Crimea about Ukraine has just been totally incremental. And so it's you know in no way surprising that they haven't 
blessed uh, a some kind of uh, concerted uh, victory plan. And the pattern is, as I think we all know, is to say, well, doing such and such a thing would be too dangerous or would take too long. And then they eventually get, get around to doing it, but they don't do it quite enough. Uh, and then they do it a little bit more. And that's that's unfortunately just the way they make decisions. And uh, I think it's very frustrating for all of us. On Crimea, I guess one thing I'll, I'll add is I think, unfortunately, this is one area where uh, Russian information operations have had some success. And by that, I mean in convincing uh, the American government, well, Sevastopol is somehow is historically a Russian Base. There's a lot of history associated with it and the Crimean War and World War II and so on. And, you know, Khrushchev gave Crimea to Ukraine and that was a big mistake uh, and, and all that sort of stuff, which is all baloney and it's all nonsense. But but I think the thing is that that stuff did penetrate, uh, unfortunately, into the heads of some of the people making decisions. And that that has made them think of Crimea not quite as Russian territory, but not as unambiguously Ukrainian territory as, as in fact it is. And uh, that's that's a real problem. And it's a result of people not knowing a whole lot of history, I think, or being able to look at geography in a perfectly sensible way. So yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think that's it. And I apologize. I, I have to go get off to take another call. Thanks so much. And so let's do a quick wrap up on this subject with Glenn and then Luke and John, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I would just say, uh, keep your eyes on Budanov and his interviews. Um, and I find them very intriguing about Ukrainian strategy. It reveals a lot about what they're thinking and, and planning to do, uh, but you got to read it in the right way. And why I say that? Because yesterday there was an attack on an S-400 uh, system inside Russia by Ukraine. And if you read what Budanov has said in the past, he is trying to teach the United States, or he said Ukraine is trying to teach the United States, that Ukraine can strike repeatedly inside of Russian territory and the Russians won't do anything about it other than bomb Odessa and with Shahids and uh, try to hit the Ukrainian power plants. And and he and now and that messaging is more for the United States than it is. It's also designed as part of the war effort, but there's a larger message behind that, and and that's what they keep trying to do is show that that they can do that. And I hope and by hitting Ukraine, they're also in that same message. Uh, what Elliot was talking about, Andre was talking about, is that repeatedly showing they could strike Ukraine or Crimea and 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 demonstrate those capabilities to to really. Uh, isolated. So I'll stop there. Andre, do you have any um, last comments? Uh, yes, and uh, and then I need to run as well. But thank you for first of all, thank you for invitation. Thank you for support. And uh, and let's remember, uh, we cross so many red lines uh, set up by Russia that we kind of stop counting them, and we stop like actually even looking at them. They've been setting red lines about U.S. support. They've been setting red lines about annexed territories about hates on Russia, about he and Crimea, and so on and so on. So this is all uh, we are, we need to have a we need to have a very clear and determined uh, victory for a victory vision. Uh, and uh, we need to have it together and we need to pursue and we need to even because now we hear about a long war. Many people saying, oh, the war is going to be long and so on and so on. But the long wars, even if it's longer than some people wanted, and certainly we didn't want them to be to, to be long, it still need to be won. So we still need to be. Uh, we still need to to have a clear understanding how we're going to win it, because we're absolutely not interested in that taking like years and years and decades and so on. And um, and uh, whoever has any influence in in your city, I mean seriously, we need to be on the same page where we're going. We're missing this still, and this is not not good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be brief. We have to start wanting Ukraine to win more than we just hope that Russia is going to lose. Once we take this mentality, these debates about whether to strike Crimea or not, is it allowed, is it good, is it bad, becomes secondary or if not irrelevant. So we need to change in mindset on how we see uh, this war. John? Uh, we need also to stop deterring ourselves. Um, we have bought into Putin's nuclear threats 
and this has been a principal or the principal reason for our, our timidity in sending weapon systems and establishing a convoy for grain shipments and a whole variety of other measures that we should have taken a hard look at. Uh, we hear occasional bleats that this, this concern is diminishing in the administration, but we haven't actually seen it in the policy. Uh, to win this, to do the right thing, to make sure this turns out right in the quickest way possible, we need to put this one aside. Thank you. Thanks, John. And I'll just end by saying that whoever controls the sea lanes and the air power wins. And uh, the United States has quite a bit to say over how that's done. And um, and just to be a little less kind than John, get off the dime and make it happen. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>